Hello and welcome to the Goldsmith Odyssey. I'm Yavar Marathi, joined by my colleague, David Lichty. Hi there. And this time we have something a bit new and unusual, which for lack of a better term, I've decided to call a production report. It's not really a soundtrack spotlight episode because the soundtrack album doesn't exist yet, uh, but it will early next year because for the first time since we began our podcast in early 2018, a new orchestral recording of Jerry Goldsmith's music has been produced. And in fact, it's of two of his scores, which have never before been released on album in any capacity. His very first feature film score from 1957 for the underrated Western noir Black Patch and his 1972 score for The Man, a TV movie production turned theatrical release starring James Earl Jones as Douglas Dillman, the, fr nah, the fictional first black president of the United States. The original recordings of both fine scores have long since been lost, so Entrada Records took it upon themselves to fill the gap in all our Goldsmith collections, having them reconstructed by Goldsmith expert Lee Phillips and newly recorded just this past month by the Royal Scottish National Orchestra under the baton of conductor William Stromberg. We are fortunate enough to have both Bill and Lee with us here today to discuss their recent work while it's fresh in their minds. But first, I would like to start the discussion with our friends at Entrada Records, Doug Fake and Roger Feigelson. Doug and Roger, welcome back to the show. And could you start out by telling us how you decided on Goldsmith as a follow-up to your first successful Kickstarter? Yeah, your first successful Kickstarter for Dmitry Tiomkin's Dial M for Murder in 2018. Which yeah, of you I first had the idea and and kind of how did it develop over time until you ultimately launched the successful Kickstarter campaign earlier this year? Yeah, I can sort of kick off the genesis of the project and then Doug can get into more of the, the details of how cool it was to, to do great. this. But, uh, you know, the Kickstarters are a great way to fund a project like this that on our own, we would never ever be able to recoup. And, but there are limits. So you, you could look at a score that's 90 minutes long with a big chorus and big orchestra. We could never raise enough money through a Kickstarter to do it. So one of the things I was cognizant of was something that was practical for a Kickstarter, but also learning, we learned a lot from the Dial M campaign around how much traction you get with people and how much is, is, is you're able to raise. And so I really was looking for something that was manageable in length, not overly large orchestra so that the costs would be much more manageable. And uh, Paul Talkington had called me and said, hey, there's an opportunity in um, October, September, I, I'm losing, pandemic is maybe lose all track of time. A couple of months ago, I said, he said, we have this opportunity in September, October, because they, they got a new control booth in the this, this studio there. And for this promotion, we can actually, it, it'll be economical for you to record there. And I said, that's great. Um, what do we do? I, I know in my head what the parameters are. And so I was kind of racking my brain. So I went to, to Doug and Jeff and, and the team and I said, hey, here's an idea. We have this opportunity. Why don't we do Black Patch? Because it's a shortish score. It's not a huge orchestra. It's Goldsmith who has a large following. There's never been a recording. We know the elements are missing. It's like perfect. And then I thought, well, it is kind of short. Maybe and I thought of the man, because I know Doug was a big fan of the man. I said, you know, that's also small and it's really, really short. That would be a great compliment. And we have a model like that one when we did the Agony Ecstasy Prologue and Rio Concha. So I floated that. And um, Doug, you can you can you can tell what your first reaction was when you heard about that project. Maybe the second reaction, because the first reaction, maybe you vomited on the floor. I don't know. But what was your second reaction when I brought that project to you? I thought it was a great idea. I've mentioned to Roger right off the bat, one of the advantages of doing black patch is there's no trumpets, <clears throat> that's a darker score. So that would reduce the size of the orchestra. And then with regards to um, the man, there's no violins. So that bring the size of that orchestra down as well. So we talked about it now as a financially, it seemed like it was doable. Um, and because the dial M for murder Kickstarter had already been in place and that had worked out pretty well for us. We just talked about kind of following suit with something now that would probably have a, a bit wider audience. You know, Jerry Goldsmith has a little bit more of a bankable, if you will, audience than Dimitri Tiomkin does. Doug, in the past, you've told me a little bit about discussing Black Patch with Jerry himself. Can you share that with the group here? And also, did Jerry ever say anything to you about the man? Did you ever bring that one up with him? Yeah, I mean, over the years, 
you know, there's that period of time where we were working closely together. You know, we would stand beside each other, um, mixing albums and stuff. So there was a lot of conversations. I can't remember all of them, um, but I brought up just about every every score you can imagine. Usually, in um, in terms of who orchestrated and things of more of a technical nature, because obviously you can watch the movie to see see the music or hear it. But it would usually be like who orchestrated Black Patch, you know, for example. And he would say, well, I did that one, Doug. You know, that would be his kind of response. And I would say, well, you know, I noticed there's no trumpets in it. He said, yeah, I wanted a dark edge to the score. If you see the movie, you know, it's dark, dark Western. So it was that kind of conversation. So with regards to the Black, you know, Black Patch specifically, um, I don't recall him saying anything about how much he liked or disliked the music. But on a technical level, I do recall him talking about, you know, a darker edge. It's not a not your typical Western of that era. You know, it's a pretty brooding kind of Western. It's not an mm -hmm. action Western. You know, it's, it's psychological. It's about the characters. Right. Rather yeah. than than the action so much. Did did he did he talk about, you know, <clears throat> his approach to to it being more character based or anything like that? I guess in general, he kind of had a character based approach to a lot of his scores. It was, it was about the emotions and, and what the characters were going through. Yeah, though he could also approach his, you know, action in a mm -hmm. way that almost no other composer did. You know, his, his action music was more, um, it's aggressive, but it isn't chaotic dissonance, if you will. It's mm -hmm. more rhythmic based, you know, he would have ostinatos and things like that. And the other thing that he did in Black, in Black Patch and Lee, of course, brought this out when he, he gathered all the materials for us. Um, it's, a, it's a very well-constructed score, you know, the architecture of it. There's motifs and ideas that recur throughout. So once you get into analyzing it, you realize it isn't just you know, written out as a you know, typical Western score, but it's really thought out in terms of how um, organic each item would be and how it would flow into something else. I do recall we talked about the love theme because mm -hmm. that's kind of a standout feature of this particular score. So, you know, we talked about that. Um, I don't recall him having any particular, yeah, I liked it or whatever. I just remember him appreciating that I noticed it. Well, when we covered it three and a half years ago on the Goldsmith Odyssey, it kind of blew my mind because it's a score that reveals more and more as you dig into it deeper, it's not a, it's not just a surface level score. The first thing you notice is that gorgeous theme for the romantic scenes for sure. But then, you know, over time I realized, Oh, Hey, this is actually a character theme for the title character. And it's, and it's in a romantic guise here, but it's also there, you know, that, that material is there at the very opening kind of fanfare. And it's there at the end of the score as, he, uh, as the main character, Clay and Carl are kind of going off to deal with the bad guys. And it plays when some detective work is going on. It's a very malleable, uh, but memorable melody. And he also wrote individual motifs for other characters. Like Hank has a motif and Carl has a motif. And there's even a, a brief motif for Helen. Um, so like all four principles have their own kind of musical ideas. And in a score, the length of Black Patch, which is just over half an hour, it's like, it's a surprisingly complex and ambitious work, I think, for a first time film composer, J you know, Jerry just doing this for the very first time. Did, uh, did Jerry ever say anything to you, Doug, about the man? Yeah, we talked more about that one because you know, I'm a particular fan of military, his military <laughs> scores and things that have to do with that, that nature. So um, um, we had a lot of conversations about it. More, I would tell him how much I admired it. And he would respond with more of a slightly casual, yeah, yeah, that worked, you know, that kind of stuff. I think mm -hmm. I, I told him, yeah. I was going to ask you a question. Wasn't there a recording session that you were at that Jerry was conducting and they brought in a piece from the man as a joke? Are you sure you, got, you want to bring that into this? <laughs> you, yeah, you got so excited by it. There, and then yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, this, is, this is a pretty humorous anecdote, but um, um, 
we, uh, Jerry had invited us to the Star Trek V recording sessions. I think people know about that. So we were there every day. We sat actually out on the floor by the cellos. And uh, there was just this one point. And when I say we, I mean, friend Fred, Fred Shepard and I. And uh, there was this one point when they were taking a break and Jerry got off the podium and he went to do whatever he was going to do during a break. Um, and the contractor made a point of saying, everybody stay where you are. Let Jerry leave. Jerry left. The contractor said, we're passing out this little piece of music for you. And the contractor actually goes, um, this is a little picture Jerry and I did many, many years ago called Demand. And uh, Fred and I literally stood on my seats. I mean, we were talking orgasm time. I'm not kidding, because we thought <laughs> we're about to hear the AFM players are going to do Demand. You know, I mean, it's never been recorded. It's a really exciting moment. Anyhow, so they talked for a few minutes. They got ready. Jerry comes back. The contractor gets everybody seated, seated as, as they're supposed to. And Jerry said, okay, back to 5M2 or whatever it was they were working on. But instead, all the musicians started playing the man. Only what they played was some kind of weird little ditty. You know, and Fred and I looked at each other and said, what is this? And we, we are, it was just the biggest disappointment we'd ever had because we were so pumped up during that 10 minute break to hear the man. And we ended up hearing whatever that was. <laughs> wow. That's a funny practical joke. So I was about to say, I guess back then the written scores for the man did survive, but it, it, maybe not because they just had this little joke thing instead. Yeah. And I mean, it's nothing I recall in the picture either. It's just it, mm -hmm. whatever it was, it was some, it was a private joke between the contractor and oh, Jerry, funny. obviously. And it was to, it was to get Jerry to laugh. And I don't really even recall Jerry having much of a reaction except scratch at his head, you know, and says, what happened to five M two, you know, or something <laughs> of that nature. Down but to it was, it's more, it was a big disappointment because, you know, Fred and I didn't know what to expect. I and mean, we weren't part of the joke. We just thought we're about to hear da -da 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 -da, with all the brass and everything. Instead, we got, you know, tiddlywinks. Well, you've already, you, at, you raised an interesting point, though, about the existence of parts or score or anything. And that was my first thought when I was, was like, where on earth are we going to find these? And we're probably not. So I thought, well, who can I call on that actually would have the expertise to put this back together by ear if needed? And I'm thinking, who could that be? Who could that? And then Lee, of course, actually, no, it was no deliberation. Like, I got I to gotta reach out to Lee because I need to find out if this is going to be feasible or not before we proceed. Yeah, if you can put together the salamander from listening to a foreign blu-ray release then i guess you can do many things <laughs> uh, okay well before we move on to lee i want to bring in uh another first time guest here uh joining us for the first time from the entrada family is comedian youtube star extraordinaire expert conan the barbarian insert flipper and most importantly the guy who sends us all goodies in the mail it's jeff johnson entrada's shipping manager jeff i'm a big <laughs> fan i'm so glad to have you join us on the show can you tell us a little bit about your own relationship with black patch and the man and kind of give us your behind the scenes perspective of how this project developed sure um Actually, Black Patch is a score I'm really, I'm not familiar with at all. It was the man that I was, well, sort of familiar with. And that was because that was just a movie that I really wanted to see. And for many years, it just wasn't available to me. Um, I always wanted to see it, obviously. It still isn't commercially available. It's, it's one of the rare ones. I think, is it the only Jerry Goldsmith film? theatrical release that that hasn't been put out on dvd or anything it's it's just gone yeah. no vhs even like no i don't know like you high could, velocity i was finally able to see it a few years ago because someone put it on youtube but you know years and years ago i i wanted to see it because goldsmith scored it but as i'm also a big rod serling fan and he wrote the screenplay so i've just always wanted to see this movie and it it just never seemed to even get shown anywhere on tv and it seemed like the only people who were familiar with it were the people who watched it when it first aired. And of course, Doug had <laughs> seen it when it when it first aired. So for many years, 
the only way that I've ever heard any music from the man was Doug humming the main title fanfare when we were working together in the store. So he would describe the opening. By the way, I, I hummed all the parts. Yes, you did. I actually, you know, I did, you know, you know, triple stops on my voice. Well, there you go. I don't even know what that <laughs> means, but um, he would describe the opening scene for me multiple times. James Earl Jones answering the phone and saying, yes, this is Douglas Dillman speaking. Um, so that that was my soundtrack to the man for a very long time was Doug humming it. So I guess that will I guess that it will always be special to me for that reason. But um, OK, Doug, I'm going to set you up. Yes, this is Douglas Dillman speaking. Bum, 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 bing, bing. That's the timpani part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you do all the parts, I'll mix them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who needs an orchestra? <laughs> yeah, right. You have, you, you have to start with Burgess Meredith's line when they have the conversation about who's next in succession because of this freak accident. Sure. Okay, you play Burgess, Burgess Meredith. Meredith going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That would be Douglas Dillman. Phone ringing. Yes. This is Douglas Dillman speaking. Excellent. There you guys so, go. So I mean, that's this... why I, I'm super excited to finally get an album of this. Yeah, now you can can actually enjoy it on an album rather than Doug's performances of it. Not that it's, his performances, it's it's no, it's pretty it's... good, but actually the, uh, people tend to forget um, while it was intended for television. I mean, that's how it was budgeted. Mm -hmm. It's a theatrical film. Mm -hmm. Its premiere was in the theaters. Paramount picked up the picture and ran it in theaters. Um, ABC still controlled it, but it was a Paramount film in theaters um, mm -hmm. before it was on television. So it's, um, you know, technically it is a theatrical film. Now, Doug, did you ever get to see it theatrically, just to hear the music through better I speakers did. than it? Did I, you? I went to the opening night of it. I sure how did. did. The, how did it sound? I mean, you you have a single television speaker in nineteen. What is it? Seventy two for the man. Yeah, did I got the right year. I mean, you've got this little tiny speaker is all we're going to hear for the longest time. I imagine. How did the music sound? You know, which was recorded to be played through a television speaker. How did it sound in the movie theater to you? just louder i mean literally okay. i mean yeah. yeah it's still a mono it's mixed with sound effects and dialogue and stuff in the right. theater so um it wasn't a stereo picture it wasn't recorded in stereo so you know it's just louder per se okay but but i mean still hearing that fanfare for the first time i mean that's you know i mean it's aaron copeland come alive you know it's pretty spectacular I get a similar question, just mainly because you guys are on the West Coast, which is sort of a, a mecca for repertory cinema. Has anyone had a chance to see Black Patch on the big screen? Because my experience with the music is through YouTube or a DVD, which is you know, a DVD can have pretty good sound. But I mean, it's not like hearing, you know, the full resonance of a of a of a horn or a string when it comes in that way. Did you guys, did anyone see that projected? No, it doesn't seem like something would pop up a lot, but you never know. The Egyptians got some, some interesting people running it. But what Jeff's story reveals is that Doug, this has been a Holy grail score for you for some time. I think it's not just some footnote in Goldsmith's filmography. It's one that you really connected with enough to make this, you know, recurring joke and in joke between you and Jeff over the years that, that you've, you know, felt so strongly about to keep going. Well, that it, that is true. I mean, it's, it's my kind of Goldsmith score. I admit, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, I was always looking forward to it. I I'd hoped for a recording of it. Roger and I tried to find master elements, tried to put the deal together with ABC, all, all of that kind of stuff. I'm sure other labels did as well. So, 
It right. always remained a very elusive item. And because of its lack of availability in the, in the home video marketplace entirely, that just made it that more elusive. But mm -hmm. I had a tape I had taped off television when it first premiered on television because I had, you know, knew it was by Jerry Goldsmith at this point. So, um, I mean, it was just, you know, way, way back when. So it was just a cassette tape. But that's the item I played for Jeff many, many times. And mm -hmm. ironically, I think that's what at least the gestation of this with Lee was my sending Lee a copy of that um, tape for him to you know, become familiar with the score. I think that's what we brought, you know, William into the picture around the same time with listen to this and see what your thoughts are. This so at this point, good. why why don't we bring in Lee Phillips and William Stromberg? Uh, Lee and Bill, welcome. And uh, and Bill, this is your first time on the podcast. So glad to have you here. Uh, I've known you for many years, and and you know you're one of my favorite conductors, especially when it comes to Bernard Herrmann. It's so great to have you on Goldsmith now. Could each of you take turns uh, telling us about when Entrada reached out to you about working on these two Goldsmith scores and what your initial reaction was? Sure. Do you want to go first, Lee, or you want me to? Um, uh, Bill, you go first because I think you were probably approached before I was. Maybe okay. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, no, you go actually, for it. Anyway, okay, all right. Um, anyway, I'm such a huge Goldsmith fan; it's unbelievable. And with the success of Dial in for Murder by Dmitry Tiomkin, um, I was so grateful that Doug and Roger reached out to me and asked me if I'd like to conduct Jerry Goldsmith's very first film score and the man and i'm such a huge fan of goldsmith of course i said yeah what like i'll pay my own airfare whatever and um it was just such a thrill to be able to conduct um jerry goldsmith's very first score and um i was just honored that they asked me to do it and then i know yeah, I was just going to say that uh, I know that you and uh, your your long term partner, John Morgan, had talked for years about eventually doing a Jerry Goldsmith score. I think he was thinking of the reincarnation of Peter Proud. Right. Or was it something no, else? No, we, we've we always wanted to do <clears throat> List of Adrian Messenger. Brand oh, new. that's right. He's mentioned that yeah. one to me a lot, too. So, yeah, this was like a long term goal for you. This wasn't just, a, yes, you know, a job or something like that. You You've been wanting to conduct Goldsmith for many years now. Absolutely. And let me tell you this, doing Black Patch was actually perfect for me as a conductor because I've been doing all this gold, uh, golden age music, you know, Max Steiner, Herman, Waxman, everyone, and Newman. And I noticed that Goldsmith, obviously still being 27 years old, right, mm -hmm. uh, when he scored this film, he still had a foot in the golden age when he wrote this score. So it's kind of a perfect transition that I would come in and do the first goals, my first Goldsmith score conducting wise, that it would be more of a golden age kind of a sounding thing, if you know what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, so, yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was perfect. So, yeah. Hey, Bill, um, Doug said he sent you a tape of his tape of the black, Ma black, black magic, black patch uh, recording. So you could listen to it and tell him what you thought. What kinds of things are you listening for in that circumstance? What kinds of questions are you trying to answer? Well, what I sent him actually was, was the man. Oh, I'm sorry, the man. Right, oh, right. Because that, that's what wasn't really That's what you would take off of available. television. Right, right. Okay, well, then with the man, uh, Bill. Bill's is, actually what, leaving out one thing that's possibly humorous, possibly enjoyable to hear. Um, I had talked when I, when I called Bill and talked to him about doing this, because he and I keep talking about projects we want to do together. And um, I brought up the idea. You know, Roger and I are thinking of launching a Kickstarter on a Jerry Goldsmith album. I talked to Bill. The first thing he said is actually the same thing that Bruce Broughton said on multiple occasions, because, as you know, for many years, Bruce Broughton was conducting our Excalibur series. And they both said the same thing. And that was, I'll quote Bruce, and I'll leave Bill to quote himself. But Bruce once, when I talked to him about recording a Jerry Goldsmith score, Bruce goes, I'm not going to do it, Doug. I'm not going to record anything by Jerry Goldsmith. And I said, don't you admire his music? Bruce goes, yeah, that's the problem. 
I'm a big admirer of his music. So are everybody else. I'm not going to get judged conducting anything by Jerry Goldsmith. They'll be shooting arrows at me. And uh, so when I talked to Bill, the first thing when I said, um, so how would you feel about conducting uh, Jerry Goldsmith's album? He goes through the whole, I love Goldsmith, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, um, ooh, gee, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to do a Jerry Goldsmith album. The fans are going to hate me for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's partially accurate. <laughs> Remember, I told you also, I'm such a huge Goldsmith fan that I wanted to hear these scores reproduced perfectly. And I figure since I'm in the position to do this, I want to hear these scores just like all the fans do. I, I, I just love it so much. And um, yeah, <laughs> it's I mean, Goldsmith we were, was amazing. We were in agreement. And it's so cool. It's so cool to see his um, how he progressed with his composition. You know, so to hear this very first score, Black Patch, the man we'll talk about later, but Black Patch, you hear elements of the Golden Age, like Alfred Newman and Herman and everything in it, and he's still. You, but you can tell he's developing his voice as he's going along. And it's really, really, really wonderful to hear Goldsmith putting his fingerprints on things that are going to be later major things like Total Recall and Star Trek, the motion picture, you know. But anyway, no, I, I was absolutely thrilled to do this. And basically, my point was I wanted to hear these albums. So I'm going to go back to my question. When, when they send you a tape to ask you to sort of evaluate the project, what what is it you're trying to figure out listening to a score that you don't actually have the sheet music for? What kind of questions are you trying to answer when you get this audio cassette of the man? Well, obviously, I mean, I mean, I have a pretty good command over the orchestra, so I wasn't too worried about, you know, the execution of it. But um, when I first heard it, yeah, I was thinking, well, what's funny is when you first hear Goldsmith's music, this is interesting, actually. Um, it sounds different than it's written. It's, this is a very strange phenomenon for Goldsmith. He writes these extremely slow tempos for things where the orchestra is doing gymnastics and jumping through hoops. And the conductor is doing basic beats, like slow beats, while the orchestra is going crazy. So I wasn't quite ready for that. And... I actually learned a lot by doing these two recording, the two new scores that I didn't realize Goldsmith wrote a lot of slow tempos where the orchestra is doing all the crazy work, if you know what I mean by that. So, yeah, he, he was writing a lot of, I don't know, 16th notes or something <laughs> or 32nd notes within a, a bar that was a slower tempo in terms of what you're conducting. Exactly. exactly right yeah like one of the big scenes in black patch it's an extremely slow tempo temp metronome uh 50 which is you know tick 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 but the orchestra is going along going you know it's 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 really crazy it's like i wasn't ready for that because all the stuff i've done before yeah you, know, you would imagine the tempo would be faster doing all the crazy eighth notes and, and 16th notes, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I learned a lot doing this score and I learned a lot about Goldsmith because it dawned on me also, and one of my favorite scores is 100 Rifles. And it dawned on me that that score, the tempo is extremely slow for the main theme and the orchestra is doing all the work. Ba -dum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, bum you know? Uh, it's it's just really interesting. I learned a lot doing this. So Lee, let's bring you in now. And and what was it like when uh, Doug and Roger first got in touch with you about working on this? Um, I think it was uh, it was Roger who first uh, reached out um, with an email, and this was uh, I, I think probably sometime uh, around uh, July um and uh a juvenile july and uh he mentioned that they were thinking of doing a, a goldsmith project a, a kickstarter for um black patch and uh and the man um and i think at first we weren't 100 sure 
that we could get hold of uh, any written uh, materials uh, in the initial stages. Um, and because I, I guess I've done a lot of takedowns in 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 the past with you know, Goldsmith projects or or, or over OSHA projects. Um, Takedown meaning by ear. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes the the, the Miklos Rocha projects weren't exactly plain sailing um, because of uh, a lack of materials, or you know, certainly with Thief of Baghdad materials scattered to the four winds. Um, so you know, the, the takedowns have become something of a specialism, I think, for me over over the last ten years, especially. Um, so Roger wanted to know how long it would take. Um, and uh, I kind of said, well, it, 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 if Black Patch is, it, it, is sort of 30 something minutes long, then I could probably do about 10 minutes a week. Um, and so I, I'm going to need, you know, three or four weeks to do to do something like that. Um, and then the man on top of that, maybe like another two weeks, uh, maybe slightly longer because you never know what you're going to get with, uh, with, with, with audio, um, with audio materials. So sometimes it can, it can take a little longer. Um, so the, 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 the initial discussions were, I, uh, I think mainly logistical ones. Uh, Roger wanted to know if he could get it ready for September. And I was like, well, if more time would be great, because it's always good to have more time to make sure stuff is right. But if you don't have that time, then you'll have it by September. Um, some, somehow. Um, and then uh, a, a couple of weeks later, um, he got in touch and said, uh, ah, we've got uh, hold of Jerry's original charts for um, Black Patch from the Herrick. Um, so I was like, ah, super duper. So th th that means we can do it in like, uh, you know, Black Patch can be done in possibly 10 days or something like that, you know, uh, just Once you uh, have the dots, as you as you like to put it, it makes things a lot different uh, yeah, in terms of your approach. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, and the man, the, the man was it, it, the status quo. So you know, nothing exists for the man. So that was from audio only. So that was still still going to take two weeks, and then some turnaround time for um, for part preparation as well. Um, and uh, that 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 was. Uh, that was it. I mean, I, I was super excited to do it because um, I hadn't done any reconstruction work for about three years. Um, so although I, I have been orchestrating and you know doing concert suites and and the odd thing over you know since the last uh, since King of Kings, um, no, since Dracula, sorry, um, the, I, I've been doing the odd thing, but no, you know weighty reconstruction work and i i really miss that and i i really missed you know getting into the studio with a, with an orchestra and just bringing the stuff to to, to life again so uh, although i was you know un, uh, admittedly unfamiliar with both scores um because i mean y Yvonne and, and, and david we, we've had this conversation in the past that, that you know that sort of very very early goldsmith is is not exactly my bag um, in, in in terms of preference, uh, the, the the movie scores from sort of like maybe the the very very early like in sixties or whatever, um, uh, the, the the stuff which resonates with me much more readily is like nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties. Um, so uh, I was like I said I was unfamiliar with these. I mean, the man nothing is available. I've never seen it. I've never heard of the film. Um, so it, it, the man was a revelation. When I heard the tape that uh, the, the tapes that, that, that Doug sent, I was like, <laughs> I thought, Jesus, where, where did this come from? And I, how come nobody has, has, has released this before? I mean, it's it's it, it's short, you know. It's it's very very to the point, but there's so much great stuff packed into this very very short score. It's so well crafted and. Uh, I mean, it's a classic example of like Goldsmith's economical approach, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's, there, there's no fat on it whatsoever. It's very, very lean. It's very to the point, but, but really, really strong thematic material. And he always plays the stuff where it counts most. Um, 
I, I guess there's a similar approach that you know, that he took to Patton. You've got this huge long movie and about you know twenty minutes worth of music or or something ridiculous like that. It's it's a um, similar ratio. It was half an hour of music for a three hour long Patton, and I think the man is under uh, an hour and a half long, or it was probably for a two hour time slot on TV as originally envisioned sure. before it went to theaters. And uh, and he wrote under 15 minutes of music for it. So it's very similar spotting percentage as. Yeah. Patton. And uh, with Black Patch, uh, I, I, I wasn't that that struck with the film when I watched it on on YouTube. But the more I worked on the score when I was inputting the stuff, I thought, yeah, <laughs> this the. This sounds like a guy trying to prove a point. Uh, it's it's really so well considered, and again, sort of like meticulously crafted for somebody who's so you know so so young. Um, and the curious thing about it is uh, that, that I might it, I could almost like sort of like <laughs> reevaluate my feelings towards goldsmith's music from that era and sometimes i'm wondering if it's not so much the music i don't like but the recording quality because mm -hmm, right. I, I i i'll admit i'll admit this and the we've we've had the 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 initial mixes uh sent from simon um and i think uh, i've listened to black patch about 10 times so far and i love it uh, i think i think it's great and simply i i think because of the the new sonics you know um, the fact it's been re recorded with modern technology and everything is just so much more open and so much there's so much more life to it all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's 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 really wonderful. It's a terrific score. And the, the, the other the other big bonus, of course, we've got with this is that I knew we'd we'd have Bill in the middle, and you know, the, with with someone like that in front of the orchestra, you know that they're just going to take it someplace else. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he did, uh, it, it, I it, remember, yeah. yeah, when we recorded the very first cue, the Warner Brothers shield, and you said, after we read it down one time, you said, oh, Matt, you said, oh my God, this is going to be a great day. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, the, the, these, the, these are definitely the, 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 the easiest recording sessions I've, I've ever been to. I mean, it was just like 100% stress-free. I mean, always, you know, when, when there's something relatively large to record, you go into a studio and you're a little bit, uh, there, there's a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of butterflies. Um, but uh, with this, everything was was so chilled. The the, the orchestra are just uh, just they're just a dynamo. I mean, you, you just wind them up and let them go, and they they they're just they are just super. Um, and and Bill's got a lovely way with the orchestra. Also, there's there's a there's a great like camaraderie, if you will. Um, yeah, except I apologize too many times. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, uh, one, of the, one of the things that really helped too was the very first downbeat of the very first thing we did was that Warner Brothers shield and nobody had ever heard it before because Warner Brothers didn't use it. No, so, that's the, that's the but, big surprise, isn't it? Actually. Yeah, with that, so, with, with so the first action. thing, yeah, yeah. The first thing we were all doing, it was, wow, you know, none of us have ever even heard this before. This is how it's starting. Yeah. That's, I mean, a, it's, that's, it, a, that's it, a very it, imposing fanfare. Do you think it's the case that they never actually recorded it, that it was shortened before they even? I don't know, because well, I... they do have that French horn. The French horns do start. Yes. I, I get the impression that they wouldn't record just those first couple bars of French horn mm -hmm. and then not the rest. It, I mean, I think there's a cut there. Music editorial there is, decision there is was music. Cut. There is music in the film, but it's only about eight seconds worth. It's really, really, sh I mean, it's unusually short. For Jerry it's only, Skew, especially it's only the, the first four bars of this yeah. piece of music. Mm. Yeah, the so French really wrote part, a full thing. Yeah. yeah, the French horn part plays, but then he's got a yeah. full fanfare that finishes the Warner Brothers shield. Mm -hmm. And oh, wow. that, I think, editorial, Warner Brothers just decided to cut. Yeah, it's mega cool. It's, it, it, it's a great opening. But I, I could almost understand, I could almost understand why perhaps they cut it because it's, it doesn't, 
I, I guess perhaps follow the, the the tone that they wanted for the film, as everybody has said. It's it's it's, it's dark. It's kind of like a character study, and this is a real ballsy flourish. I mean, it's it's a it's a killer opening piece. Wow. It'll sell the album. I, I think you're alone. right about that. Yeah, the the interesting thing is in that era of the golden age, I thought that um, like all Warner Brothers films had the Max Steiner logo music and it would get oftentimes reperformed so that it would flow into the, the film score. So Max Steiner had composed a Warner Brothers logo uh, piece and it was like in everything. And, it, and unlike, say, the 20th Century Fox fanfare, it was oftentimes reperformed and it, and it became kind of iconic. So it's kind of a, a striking thing that on this small independent film that was getting distributed by Warner Brothers, they had this first time composer do an original piece for it. Even if they didn't end up keeping the whole thing, it's, it's quite striking to have, you know, Jerry Goldsmith music over, you know, even if it's just for those eight seconds over the Warner Brothers logo. You're so right, Yavar. I mean, Warner Brothers, I mean, there were a few composers like Adolf Deutsch and Franz Waxman who would write their own music over the shield and not use Max Steiner's uh, mm -hmm. fanfare. But yeah, in general, that was pretty much standard practice all the way till 1957, I would imagine. Yeah. Do you guys yeah, know it's... offhand? I know that uh, the Steiner theme disappeared really until 1984, and it was Goldsmith and Dante who brought it back because they also brought back the Warner Brothers Shield logo, which had well, been replaced actually, with that red thing. Is, is, am, I, am I off on my timing? No, Nicholas Rocha really brought it back with time after time, I'll tell you that. Oh, that it was in that too. Yes. Yeah, that was a big deal oh, okay. at the time. Uh, it was it was part of it being kind of a throwback. Uh, okay, that was seventy nine. I want to say that was eighty one. I thought eighty or eighty one. Time after Yvonne. time, pretty close. Yeah, yeah. But I think it was it, Dante and yeah, it's Dante a and Gremlins picture. Dante and Gremlins that sort of cemented it back. I mean, I, I mean, if it wasn't the first return of it, it it after that it just became constant but uh, throughout the 70s when they had that red uh sort of graphic design style logo was there a particular piece of music or did it more just flow with whatever the score was or play silently does anybody recall because maybe they were moving away from having a logo theme i only remember rosa rosa wasn't a a real common composer for warner brothers but Green Berets was an example, that's 68. Mm -hmm. There is a Warner Brothers shield there, but it's not Steiner's music there. And in fact, Bill, do you know who wrote that? Um, no, In, I in front don't. of Green Berets, it's that percussion mm -hmm. music and it leads into the Green Berets song. You don't, don't think that, Rocha did it? I always assumed he did, just okay. because it's not part of the Green Berets ballad. Right, and I right. just assumed Rosa wrote it, but it, it wasn't a traditional Rosa piece either. It's all percussion. So, you know, I'm not sure. But anyhow, Rosa certainly had a chance to um, visit the Warner Brothers Shield in 68, and there's no Steiner music then either. You know what's hey, really interesting is this oh, was this was actually the beginning of um, three times that Jerry Goldsmith for his very first three Western feature film scores, he wrote original logo music for each of them. He did Warner Brothers logo for this one, Black Patch, and then Face of a Fugitive. He wrote kind of a fanfare piece over the Columbia uh, logo for that. And then Lonely Are the Brave, my favorite Goldsmith score, has a great kind of fanfare opening over the Universal logo when it appears on the screen. He did it for his first three Westerns. And then I don't think he did it any other times where he wrote original logo music, you know, until he was actually writing standalone logo music like Paramount and, and Universal. Actually, all the Universal titles, Gathering of Eagles, Spiral mm -hmm. Road, those all have gold he wrote unique. logo music. Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, cool. So this was just something he was doing normally at this time in his career. I have a feeling Goldsmith's respect for Franz Waxman had a lot to do with this. And I bet Goldsmith wanted to write his own music over the shield or whatever it was to bring it in. But I have a feeling because I know Goldsmith was a huge fan of Franz Waxman and Waxman would obvious would, would uh, obviously uh, do his own thing occasionally. So anyway, there might be something to that because Goldsmith's respect for Waxman. There may be something there. I don't know. 
possibly. Now, um, I'm remembering back in June or July uh, when you, Bill, actually, you first reached out to me because at the time you were trying <laughs> to find written uh, music. And I told, uh -huh. I told you about the Margaret Herrick Library. But, you know, I was really worried at the time that due to the pandemic, it would be really difficult to get a hold of Jerry's original written scores, even if they existed in the Margaret Herrick Library. Um, is there some kind soul over there at the Margaret Herrick that we should all thank who painstakingly photocopied all those old score pages for this project when they were kind of shut down? I, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah I no, think I, ma I, made, I, I made the original call to Herrick. Um, the woman that I had spoken to that time had mentioned she would see what she could do. And I think from that point on, we brought Bill and Lee into the picture. And uh, so the rest of the dialogue was from them, but it, apparently it turned out she really did what she said she would do and see if she could help us. Yeah, I do so, have, the, I have the names of the folks that helped because I had to coordinate, we had to get permission from the publisher to get access. So I had to coordinate all of that. So I had to go back and forth with them and eventually got the, the score. So do you, um, do you, do we want to shout out any of them or, or just, you know, anonymously um, thank them? They will be in the booklet. Oh, wonderful. I'd have to actually go check, pull up the email to remind myself of the name. So <laughs> no um, worries. Well, we'll, we'll uh, thank them in, in, in anonymity right now. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to their names in the booklet. I just want to give them a shout out because these are people who went above and beyond when, you know, all, from all I could tell, the Herrick was kind of shut down for, for outside stuff. So thank yeah, you guys. Still were. They still were, they had very limited access. So they went above mm -hmm. and beyond to go and help us get this stuff. And now this one-time event is in better shape than it, than it could have been before. Well, we wouldn't have had that full uh, fanfare composition for one right. thing. Cause in the film it's, it's eight seconds of French horn or whatever. And yeah, it was a, a whole composition. Lee, Lee, was there anything else that surprised you when you first saw the written scores, the scan of them versus the music you heard ripped from the film audio? Um, not a great deal uh, because it's all very complete. The biggest surprise was obviously the, was obviously the logo music. Um, the one thing which kind of stood out, and this is probably just more a practical slash technical kind of observation is the fact that the, the, the tempos that were marked sometimes on Goldsmith's original didn't exactly match the kind of thing that he was doing in the picture. You still get the impression that because he's probably, you know, he's doing a lot of this on the clock, he's free timing it, um, that, that he's trying to catch up with himself at certain at, 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 at certain points so sometimes the music races ahead for a couple of bars and then it pulls back and it races ahead and it like pulls back um i i i, I mean i i i wasn't going to the basic information was there on the score and it, and the fact that it was it was goldsmith's orchestration was actually the first thing that stood out to me because i'd never seen his handwriting on a full score before it always been uh, alexander courage or mark mckenzie or um, arthur morton obviously um so so this was the first time i'd actually seen you know full orchestral score in 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 goldsmith's handwriting so that was uh, that was a surprise um, and there, the, 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 there was a lot of, a lot of detail. There was a lot of detail on the charts. I mean, simply with, uh, uh, Black Patch, all I tried to do was try to, um, perhaps rearticulate or phrase things in, in a way that would mirror the performance that we were hearing in the picture, but wasn't necessarily reflected in in the dots or on the original charts, because Jerry had said, ah, horns, can you accent those? Or can you make those a little shorter, et cetera, et cetera. So I was just kind of making those editorial changes um, as I was inputting the, the, the material, but you know, everything 
was there. I, I mean, the, the the one thing that I didn't do was match those th those sometimes crazy sort of tempo variations. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I put in just like the, the most obvious ones, the basic ones, the initial tempo, and if there's a if there was a significant ritenuto or something like that, slowing down, I'd include that. Um, and then if something sped up, I would include that. But the the one thing I was conscious of is the you know, Bill was going to conduct this. And the, the, the last thing that I really wanted to do was to have every single bar mapped out meticulously. So it, it, it leaves no room for, you know, Bill to have any personal expression whatsoever. So interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, yeah. so the fundamental anchor points were all marked in the score with regards to the speed, et cetera. And then you just, you just hand it over to Bill and, and say, do what you feel. Yeah, exactly. No, Lee, I, I just want to say you did a magnificent job of producing these scores and parts. It was amazing. And, but yes, what you're saying, I had to listen to the original tracks and kind of toe the line and go between, okay, do I do it exactly the way it's written? But no, I have to go with the way it sounds in the film. So sometimes the scores would say Ritanuto and actually in the movie he speeds up during it so it speeds up so i was really conscious of trying to make it exactly like the movie even though i will tell you right now since he writes so many slow tempos those 42s and 50 metronome markings are so slow i actually because this is a new recording and i'm like bernard herman it doesn't matter i'm not trying to catch someone falling down the stairs um I decided to go ahead and speed up the tempo on certain areas and things like that and just kind of use my discretion. And um, But Lee's scores were perfect. And I went and marked up my scores with my big red pen. So where I want to put a fermata, for instance, that's in a the A fermata is, is holding a note longer, right? Yes, a fermata is holding the note longer. There are a couple of instances. Well, there are many, actually, where I would do something a little faster, a little slower, and make it... I try to... My goal is to make it try and, and try and sound like the original. That's my, mm -hmm. like... Well, thank, cool. thank you for doing that and not what yeah. Herman actually would do, which is slow it down a lot. Oh, no. He, yeah, yeah, he would have done it at tempo 30. Yeah. <laughs> But Bill's kind of underselling himself on this because he and I spent hours together with our scores going through it. And it was amazing how much Bill, we were playing the original, you know, the, right. obviously with dialogue and sound effects. But it was amazing how many places Bill would say, you notice this? And he would show how just for one bar, Jerry would change the tempo from exactly. what was written. And Bill would say, I'm wondering if I should be following what, what's in the picture versus you know, what feels right or what Jerry actually wrote. And so we had a lot of dialogue about, mm -hmm. and, and mostly I just deferred to Bill and kept saying, make it musical, you know, mm -hmm. because it is true. We're not trying to catch somebody falling down the stairs in exact timing. So yeah. as long as we have the, you know, the notes are correct, we're going for the right notes. Um, Bill has some leeway to try and make it, you know, a little more musical than the strict, you know, confines of what the film were requiring. So sometimes why, did you did you lean more towards the film? Bill. Wait, one one, one sorry, more key thing that? I need to point out is when I'm conducting this stuff, I have to also sometimes the music is written, you know, mezzo forte means kind of loud um and accents and things like so i'm i'm trying to bring out what ended up in the original film and sometimes it would be extremely loud compared to what was written on the music so if something's marked mezzo piano meaning kind of soft and then in the film i hear it and it's extremely loud i try and bring that out because i want to make it just like the original recording because some of the the love music is is some of the most beautiful things in this score I and mean, the love music is the most beautiful thing in the score. And um, there were times where he would write it extremely soft for the movie, you know, and we decided to, and well, and then he changed his mind, obviously on the recording session, Goldsmith. Mm -hmm. So Let I wanted swell. to make sure we did it exactly like hit. So when there's a big sweep, it goes up to, you know, double forte or forte. Yeah, or we, we talked so, a lot about that, but yeah. because you have to take into account no matter what's on the written page 
and what Goldsmith is recording with his orchestra, there's still another pair of hands and that's the music editorial department. Right. And they'll fade down, dial under dialogue or make it louder, even though Jerry hadn't intended to be louder suddenly because they want to bring it up for various mm -hmm. reasons. So you're really talking about, um, it's one of those examples when people talk about what the original is. Mm -hmm. Well, the original is probably in Jerry's head. But beyond that, there's too many hands involved in the process. So yeah, we, I kept trying to emphasize to Bill, let's go with what's on the printed page, because that at least told us what Jerry was intending. Then let's go with using the film as a guide, obviously for tempos and things. But sure. interpretive, like the love theme, um, Bill and I talked a lot about that love theme really needed to have some... Um, passionate crescendos and stuff but in the film mm -hmm. those are right where it sings like why didn't you why didn't mm -hmm. you come back why didn't you return and you know because it's a tragic love story not a happy love story and so they could be turning down the music because they don't want it to interfere with the dialogue so you know we That's had a right. lot of discussions about trying to make sure well bill it sounds like this music wants to break free here and a music editor is tuning it down because it's in the you way nailed of dialogue. it you nailed it that's exactly right yeah but that's so that's part of the reason we spent a lot of time together going through the scores and listening to the recording and i told bill again and again defer to your musicality you're, you're the musician here you're the maestro you're in front of these 60 players telling them what to do so what you feel is what we want to put down on tape. In essence, so we, you're Jerry Goldsmith. When we talk with Chris Malone, uh, who works on, on a lot of, of archival scores, he talks about unpotting them. You know, he talks about going in and if, if the tapes yeah. he has are the post music editor or sound editor tapes, they've dropped down for dialogue and back up. And it sounds like you're basically making the same educated guesses or decisions live with the orchestra you're unpotting the music in a way through performance in yeah, you know, some, trying to figure out what to keep and what to not keep of the decisions that were made after he recorded yeah sometimes it's it's more obvious than others if you're listening to the what they call the stems or the music and effects tracks or things where it's obvious because you can hear it suddenly dialed down and dialed sure. back up. When you're watching it in the picture in the context of all the dialogue now and everything, sometimes it's not as obvious. So, yeah. you know, Bill and I are sitting there, we're looking at the score. So really your only real reference, you know, the, the, what would be considered the original is you can see a crescendo written into the music. But if you're listening to the finished performance on film, you're not necessarily hearing Jerry decrescendoing or cutting them back. You're hearing other hands in the process of mixing the film. So again, I just kept saying to Bill, use your judgment. I mean, you're the composer in this sense. You're on the podium. You're interpreting it. And it's part because I knew Bill pretty well. He's so accurate. The guy is so accurate at matching things that are on the film. I mean, I've never seen anybody that can watch a picture and then sit there and snap his fingers and get the exact metronome marking without a metronome. He's just on top of it. Then is this wow. part of why you're like a little scared uh, or, or Bill said he was a little scared of conducting Goldsmith because what are the fans going to think? Like, do you, do you worry about if it's, certain way in the film and you do something differently you know what the reaction is going to be like for an example yeah i really love the loud thrilling opening to the central action cue for the jailbreak it's got this big you know big opening and it's just like thunderous right but i think e either bill or lee was telling me um on facebook messenger that it, as written it's not actually supposed to be as loud as it comes across in the film i think that's part of you know, you know, the music editor may have turned it up or something like that. So in a case like that, you know, am I going to, am I going to get the album and say, Oh, why is this so quiet? Cause I've been watching yes. the film. Yes. You are. We played it on flute and triangle only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. See the whole point. I mean, the fans are expecting here total recall or star Trek, the motion picture. Mm -hmm. They're going to listen to the score and then wonder what we're doing. Cause but it, we, we, we tried to do the best we could to represent Goldsmith's early scoring. 
but mm -hmm. the fans are going to have their own opinions you know i think we actually went over the top and made it perfect for I mean, and even better matter of fact lee's uh reconstruction of the man i think is better than the original orchestration i think lee and, opened it up some yeah no no he he added by doing to a it. takedown he actually made it better yeah. and but so the fans if they're going to criticize us they'll have to criticize goldsmith because we mm -hmm. did our best part to bring this stuff alive the way we see fit so anyway or well, Ivaris, like you know or, so. go, fans go are sorry. just well fans have an approach i mean we're all fans obviously mm -hmm. but fans have an approach and maybe the thing that hamstrings me the most when we produce these is that fans will watch a film and they get in their mindset that's definitive that's mm -hmm. that's the final word on that particular score how it's to be performed unfortunately like i say they don't take into account how many hands are involved in the mixing of a film after exactly. say jerry has recorded the score so unfortunately i mean we found this out time and time and again fans will say but how come in this one bar you do this and we'll say <laughs> oh you mean because we did what rosa wrote as opposed to what the music editor suddenly dialed down mm -hmm. right. um you and this kind of thing uh, but it's a constant battle because fans many fans anyway are unwilling to accept the concept that the music starts in the brain of the composer. Mm -hmm. It goes down to paper. It's now being interpreted by the composer in front of all these musicians who are reading what the composer's written and the conductors, you know, providing all of those steps. And then it only there, it's now handed over to a whole part of the filmmaking process that really doesn't care. I mean, I shouldn't and, uh, say they don't care. Yeah. But also remember when they recorded this, wherever they recorded it, like I'll say Black Patch at Warner Brothers, I assume, but or I have CBS no idea. or something it's, like it's that. It's totally different acoustics, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. It, different orchestra, different acoustics, different conductor, Jerry. And we go and record it over in Scotland, the Glasgow, and it's a completely different setup. Um, microphones, everything, and the players are all different. Everything's different. Yeah. And for people to we're expect thinking it's where be we exactly want alto like you. Yeah, we, we know where we want an alto flute. Yeah. Come through in the speakers, for example, in the left or the right or the center. Mm -hmm. But they're thinking in terms of they're just trying to get it down on tape to be mixed with sound effects and dialogue and all of that. That's right. And a lot of those people are not really in the composer's part of it. Often composers are not even there at these dubbing sessions and stuff. Remember, Jerry yeah. would often mention he doesn't like to go to those because they sit there and say, cut this bar out, you know, because mm -hmm. we change the timing here or move this cue over to here. And so the whole process really ends up being, um, at least in my opinion, when fans approach listening to this music, they tend to be a little bit too wedded to what they hear in the finished film. Exactly. And not, not allowing for the fact that probably even the composer wasn't intending that the mm -hmm. composer, you know, like, I guess you've already mentioned the start of this, you know, the cue, the breakout cue, it could have been that the composer had a whole different sort of architectural flow in this case, Jerry, of how he wanted that piece to go. But a music editor says hit really hard with that first, very first couple seconds of music then dial it down. So it's artificially turned up really, really loud. And right. that's what's married to the picture. And that's what fans decide is definitive. And unfortunately, um, that doesn't really reflect what Jerry wrote or what Bill's interpreting on the podium and what all these 60 musicians are responding mm -hmm. to. So and of course, both of these scores were written to be recorded in mono. They were they were expecting yes. these to be mono releases. And you've had to reimagine this for modern stereo sound and make decisions relating to that, which I think a exactly. lot of people aren't thinking about. Well, and, and if fans have heard in... these, if fans have heard these, we've heard them on YouTube. You know, what is my comparison? This isn't like watching Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, since I was 13 years old, once every two or three years and knowing every sound. I've seen Black Patch once. Mm -hmm. 
I haven't seen the man yet and I've just seen the clips. So it, it, it's sort of, if there's a score to not worry about that, this, these is, this is probably the set, you know, who, who has got <laughs> these really buried in their hearts as much as you guys really, to be honest, well, probably and the mono nobody. comment is the mono comment is interesting because I remember when we released Condor man and I got complaints that this does mix does not sound like the same mix in the film. Well, no dub. The mix in the film is mono. It's a mono film. How, do you want to mix it in the mono? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> no. Two disc just, set Condor Man reissue. One that's just mono and one that's in stereo. Yeah, two CD set. There you yep. go, Doug. We're gonna Literally, we, all, we, we all have to toe the line with this stuff, you know? We have to use our judgment, be musical, try and make it great. Like, I've done so many Max Steiner, Bernard Herman recordings, and there are times where I just make musical choices and don't make it exactly like the original or whatever. And, and I think the composers in a way would appreciate that. If mm -hmm. matter of fact, Max Steiner or Herman, they don't want to hear some matter of fact, I wonder what Goldsmith would feel about us recording this score. <laughs> He'd probably I mean, he laugh. Revisited and Rio like, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think Bill makes an important point about, you know, the, 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 the um, about allowing some space for, you know, in, interpretation. I think that, um, how can I say, that a lot of fans who are so tied to the original soundtrack forget the fact that it's it's music. Um, it's it, it it's supposed to be reinterpreted. That's the, that's half the fun of it. I mean, how many recordings of the the, the people buy of the Vaughan Williams symphonic cycle or, or Beethoven symphonies or or whomever? But each conductor brings something different. Each room that it's recorded in brings something different. Each orchestra brings something different to the table, and that's what makes it interesting. And I think, you know. Um, it, it, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in this sort of situation exactly. the, 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 the film music the, the film music community is a real sort of like hard sell because you know you've got your hard liners the type who will say I will never listen to a re-recording whether it's recorded in, in, in Prague or it's recorded by the London Symphony Orchestra um, I want the originals even though it might be in terrible terrible sort of like quality um, and then if you do a recording as as Many of you have already said people are jumping on it, saying, "Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that?" Oh, that doesn't that that doesn't sound like it d did in the movie. And I think, well, so what? Um, it's it it's music. Just let it breathe. Let it, it. It's the first time on an album like this where that music has actually been allowed to live. It's the first time you can divorce it from from the movie as. As I think Bill has said, you know, you're not trying to catch somebody falling down the stairs or somebody being stabbed in a shower. You can do whatever you want with it, you know, uh, within within reason. And you know, as long as it's tasteful, there's there's scope to to let this stuff have a life of its own. Treat it on its own merits Bravo. as music. Yes, Bravo. yes, yes. And, and yes. Lee, I think some of what you said earlier applies more than purism. Here, you talked about, and I I'm with you on this having a hard time with the earlier music, maybe being more having a hard time with the earlier recording quality. Yes. And, you know, so I bought or rather borrowed the Thriller DVDs from the library and I extracted all the isolated scores. I was not in a big hurry to break those into cues because I listened and I went, okay, well, I've got them in storage. I'll get to them eventually, but I'm not going to really enjoy listening to these. And then your CD number one came out and I just went, well, uh, you know, this early Goldsmith hasn't, is, is usually, you know, I like Goldsmith, I'm going to get it, but I'm kind of getting it under duress. Mm -hmm. And I popped it in, in my car while I was trying to drive to a friend's house for the very first time with two different GPSs giving me bad directions. So I'm frustrated and angry for 45 minutes while I'm hearing Thriller Volume 1 for the first time, and I'm more overcome by how lovely it is. Oh, uh, sorry. I, was, I thought lots of people were frustrated and angry when they heard Thriller Volume 1. But I was anyway, frustrated was... and angry from driving around, but at a certain point I was like... <laughs> This is like, and I probably had it on CD repeat all, and I didn't even notice when it restarted because I was in my car for longer than the CD was. And it was just so gorgeous that 
I think the benefits in this particular case especially far outweigh the hazards because what you did with Thriller took that music away from I am listening to almost a historical document of mm-hmm. music rather than music that's filling my room. And it turned it into music that's filling my room. And it yeah. was gorgeous and it was lovely. I'm far more excited to hear these scores because I've seen Black Patch and I've listened to the Goldsmith Odyssey episode. I wasn't part of it at the time, three or four times just to kind of get a sense of the score. I don't feel like I know this music well at all. I feel like I'm going to hear it for the first time in January or whenever this disc comes out yeah. finally. I, I mean, for the, as I said earlier on, the listening to the orchestra, you know, play this stuff for the first time and um, having listened to uh, Simon's mixes, you know, like I said, around 10 times since since we've had them, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to reevaluate. And I think that you know, I do think it's a, it's mainly a prejudice against the way the thing sounds rather than the music itself. Um, because, I mean, the Thriller actually, the, the stuff from Thriller resonated with me because I really like that Goldsmith long hair stuff, you know, uh, the, 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 the Stravinsky slash Bartok uh, influence stuff. That, that's really, really my bag. Um, so that, that that's kind of why I, I, I gravitated towards that early television music, but you know the the, the more romantic stuff from the early nineteen sixties, like, like like Patch of Blue. Dare I say it? Is I, I kind of like have a hard time with it, but I think that if it was re-recorded, I'd probably love it. You know, you could probably um, put the re-recording and the fan approach to sleep by simply saying like bill and i could get together and say okay let's record black patch yeah but let's be accurate to the picture okay so play the first four bars then cut bars five through 15 because they cut that out of the film okay and then on bar 16 um dial it down and, you know artificially in front of the orchestra everybody play all of a sudden just have everybody suddenly crescendo really loud and then cut bar 27 because they cut that bar out of the picture we could do that and then see if fans say oh this is wonderful i mean is this an accurate representation of the score or would fans go this sounds weird i, I would rather, rather have, have what you came up with it's what happened with the Phantom Menace, remember? They literally gave you what was in the film and everybody went ballistic. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> this is, this right. This is true, yeah. There are, there are, I mean, I mean, remember, Charles, again. Charles Gerhardt made, I mean, he brought all this stuff back to life in the 70s. And um, he didn't interpret the scores exactly the, the way they were in the film. No, he did and, a lot of concert uh, endings and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, he would add all kinds of stuff. Listen to his recording of Empire Strikes Back, Williams. He adds all kinds of stuff, repeats bars here and there and stuff. So there's there's room for that kind of interpretation. But you know, Doug, we like to try and present it the way it was in the film as much as possible. But anyway. And I don't want to cut you guys off, but Roger, I think, needs to eventually leave. And I want to make sure we hear from him about anything yeah, else I he actually wants do to say. Too. Oh, I need no, to yeah. leave too, so sorry. I'll just give you my, my final comment on the Kickstarter, because of course I appreciate everybody who, who contributed and supported it to make the project possible. What I found most interesting and is sort of telling for future Kickstarters is we know there's a solid fan base for Goldsmith. And I know it's a lot larger than 400 people. So we only had 400 people contribute. And we still got to our goal, which is amazing. But I really would have expected more because Jeff, I you know, 1500 copies of Black Patch came in today, you'd probably go through them all pretty quickly. So, there's at least yes. 800 people who could have at, at retail had signed up but didn't. And I don't know if it's because oh, they hit their target, um, no big deal. H- had it been twice as much, would the rest have followed? To I don't know, but it's you're kind of telling when only 400 and you know the base is very dedicated and larger didn't step up. So it's something that, you know, when we, when we talk about our next Kickstarter campaign, something I have to keep in mind as we figure Stretch out. What goals. We... Stretch goals. You know what else, Roger? Stretch there are two goals. things going on. One is that a lot of people had issues with employment because of the pandemic. And another is your Kickstarter came out after, I want to say something like 12 new goldsmith cds had been released in about a year's <laughs> time it, it almost he almost could not have picked a worse time to say please spend more money on goldsmith music because it just got so ramped up this year which has been great but 
I just thought a lot of times when when releases come out, some people will say, oh, good, there's no Rosenman. My wallet is safe if there doesn't happen to be a Rosenman release. So I would take it as a good sign, given that that a lot of people's economic situation isn't great. And a lot of Goldsmith fans have been buying a lot of Goldsmith already. My guess is you probably saw the worst case scenario with Black Patch or something close to it. I mean, I don't know. I'm just making that just educated guess, but I was pleased that you hit your goal and glad it went a little bit above too. Yeah. We also made our goal in a couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah, was yeah. Fast. Fast. Instead of at the end, like the dial M was down to the last minute. Yeah, but yeah. Yavar is right. Stretch goals, figure that yeah. out because somehow people really make those work. I don't know how you do a stretch goal with a CD, but uh, look at the look at the crowdfunding campaign for the Deep Space Nine documentary, and they added stretch goal after stretch goal. And I know that's not practical for a recording like this, but if you say something like, you know, we'll get to this amount and we'll record Black Patch, then get to this amount and we'll record the Man, then get to this amount, we can add something else. You know, on on a single disc. Maybe it's easier with something else like a, a radio scores or a live television project where that's a multiple shorter scores. But um, but yeah, I think there is a way to approach it where I mean, after after it hit that goal, it had great velocity up until that goal. But then after it hit that goal, it kind of petered off. And I think you weren't able to see that with the previous Kickstarter because it took until the last day or two to actually meet the goal for the for the Tiomkin. But I think that is common with crowdfunding campaigns when the goal is hit people think oh i don't need to support this because it's gonna happen it they met the goal it's happening and i can just buy the 20 20 cd later or even if it's a 22 or 23 dollar cd later rather than spending 30 dollars up front for something i'm gonna have to wait longer for as long as it's happening the urgency isn't there for them. They, they don't feel like they're necessarily making the difference anymore at that point. So there's, people I think there is some psychological thing. People need to remember on stretch goals with recording music, it'll only work if each of the scores recording uses the same musicians. Otherwise right. mm -hmm. you have to get a whole different session with different players oh, yeah. and with unions, you have to hire them for a certain amount of hours and stuff. So each score that you add into a stretch goal actually requires a whole new recording session with a whole mm -hmm. nother date involved. That's so why you say set the stretch goal. Practical. You set a stretch goal of like 2000, sorry, 22,000 more dollars or something, whatever the extra uh, session would cost with a different orchestra. You know, I mean, it could be a huge amount. It can be, it can be, you know, two thirds of what the regular goal is. There, there's probably some ways to do it, but I understand there's a lot of complicated. I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, you have to have a different orchestra lineup for different scores and somebody saying, oh, just why can't you throw on the uh, Rambo First Blood Part 2 end credits on there? I know I saw a lot of people making that suggestion. There's room. Why, why can't you add that on? And it's like that's an entirely different orchestra, larger than either of these. And so it's not like you can just add it to an existing session. It adds a whole nother day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, plus, exactly. Plus we got to find the parts, find yeah. the parts. Mm -hmm. And then sure. give Lee more than a day to reconstruct. So anyway, it's it's complicated. But anyway, thank you for the Tricky. time. This is a lot of fun. Pleasure. Look, uh, like thanks for being with us, half Roger. Full guy, but I think one, I think your Kickstarter went wonderfully for the timing. And two, I think there's way more good than bad about the differences in what you've done versus what was on the film. So I mean, I mean, I'm I'm usually the glass half full guy anyway, but I'm just encouraged about this whole thing, to be honest with you. And I now, hope who, you guys are too. Can well, I just say, I, yeah. I think we've like assembled a really good team for future stuff coming down the line and having Lee Phillips join our crew, crew here. Um, I'm like so excited about future recordings and I can't wait to do more, maybe even more Goldsmith, but definitely Bernard Herman, Newman, everyone and Waxman. But I'm just really, really the proud lodger? of like, what Remember Lee the Phillips lodger? did. The Lodger? The Lodger? What? The lodger, the lodger, <laughs> the lodger, the lodger anyway. as in the lodger, as in oh, the lodger. I'm sorry, the lodger. Sorry. lodger. <laughs> yes, how many times have we talked about that? Oh, I know, no, yeah, I've, I've got all the scores, John. We can reconstruct all the rest that John didn't do in that suite, and the rest anyway. of Naked and the Dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do the rest great. of the Naked and the Dead, too. and we'll redo Moby Dick. 
<laughs> yes, we'll do that too. <laughs> well, you're going to have to start uh, doing these five every year or something like that to hit everything you want to do. It sounds like. Anyway, I want to thank all you guys. Thanks for everything. Well, uh, you yeah, you got to you got to run, Bill. Bill? Yeah, I have to run. Uh, thanks, Lee, so much for all your great work. Uh, I mean, pleasure, Bill. Like, so. I mean, literally, thanks. you made this stuff sing, and especially the man doing the takedowns. It's just Bill unbelievable before. what you put into it, and and you actually went above and beyond. So it, it was incredible. Oh, thanks, Bill. Before you, and before I, you I leave, love Bill. all that subtle stuff you put in there with the the bluesy elements and things like that. It's just, it's, it's really, really great. And you have an incredible year and I'm so glad we're finally working together. Oh, likewise. Yeah. I'll see you in Glasgow. Okay, good. <laughs> Bill, before you leave, let me just ask you, you know, one more question and that is conducting this music live. Did you kind of discover any new insights into it, you know, at hearing it performed live rather than looking at it on the paper as, as Lee provided it to you. Um, you know, did you have any new reactions to it? Did you, did you get any reactions from the orchestra musicians performing it at the sessions? Like, can you talk about the October sessions themselves just a little bit? I'll tell you right now, when we started recording with that group and I gave the first downbeat and I literally got a lump in my throat. I couldn't believe it because it sounded so close to the goldsmith I love. And with all the love music and all of these great cues of goldsmith, I was just so honored to be conducting goldsmith live right there. And there's nothing like hearing the whole group right in front of you. All the, I mean, the trombones and the horns coming out, blaring at you and, and the beautiful strings and you're hearing this music come back to life where this music has been lost, you know, because the original recordings, like in the, in the mix for the film, you can't hear much. You don't hear counterpoints. You don't hear like little details, but when you hear it live right in front of you, and there were moments literally, especially during the man where I got a lump in my throat, I almost couldn't contain myself. Like I almost got a tear in my eye. It was, it was just unbelievable because I love this stuff so much. And um, the orchestra, like the RSNO is just, it, they're one of the greatest orchestras in the world. And they responded to me. They followed me perfectly. And it, anyway, with, with Lee's reconstructions and everything, it went flawlessly. It was amazing. It was just such a great experience. I mean, you know, I've been doing this stuff for years with Max Steiner, Bernard Herman, Waxman, everyone. But this was one of the smoothest recording sessions we've ever done. And I was so proud to be a part of it. And I'm so glad they asked me to do Goldsmith for my my very first Goldsmith recording. I'm so proud. Were there any musicians that particularly stood out to you? Like, oh, my gosh, that the French horn principle there just really nailed it like is anybody anybody you want to give a shout out to in the orchestra who just blew you away hey let me tell you this um, well, those french horn players are good hey let me let me tell you the the first horn player he was amazing and he really led that group um also uh the oboe player and all of the trumpet trombone and the bass section all the contrabass section they were all such good people matter of fact they came up to me and said how much they really respected this music and enjoyed playing it. Like they really came up to me. Like when we were close, when we finally did the last downbeat, they came up to me and asked me like, Hey, when are you coming back? This was really fun. This music is incredible. So, and they literally said that stuff. I don't think they were just saying that it was, it you was don't really get this great. every time. What? You don't get that every time. This, no, this was a definitely not. Sometimes you're out the door. You don't talk about it. But no, this time the orchestra, they said this was really great music. Matter of fact, the viola, the lead viola player and the cello player and, and some of the violin players came up and said, oh, and the piano player, which I love, I love her. Um, they came up to me and said, you know, this was really interesting music. We need to do more of this. It was great. I mean, they didn't say it like that, but I could tell that's what they meant. They really loved it. Oh, that's great. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Bill. I know you got to run, but uh, yeah. can't wait to hear this. You'll hear it soon. <laughs> Excellent. Bye, sir. Thank you for being here. Great to see you.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Take Doug, care. Roger. Everybody. Thanks, Bill. Lee, All we'll right. talk later, Lee. Talk later. Sure thing. Um, so, so Lee, I want to um, ask you just a little bit more about the man, because this is a case where, you know, we were just having this conversation about how, you know, the, the audience expects one thing or the, the um, customer base expects one thing, listening to music in the film. And, and maybe as originally written, it was something else with the, with the man, we're all on the same page almost because we all only had the film to listen to there weren't surviving written scores or if they do survive we don't know where they are you you didn't have them available so you had to reconstruct this entirely by ear listening to you know old recorded off tv audio and all you had was that film performance and you know whatever sort of trickery or or manipulation the music editor did that was kind of baked in. You didn't have, in this case, the dots to refer to, to be able to tell whether they took out a, a bar here or, you know, what, what is that that you're hearing underneath the sound effects or dialogue at times? So it was kind of a, a monumentally different task compared with Black Patch. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, so maybe highlight some of the trickier parts that there were to tackle. Um, uh, to be honest, when, uh, when you're doing this sort of reconstruction, the, the problems can be similar, whether or whether there are sound effects on the audio or not. Um, and one of the main things that one has to get used to is uh, filtering out <laughs> what I call kind of like sonic phantoms or artifacts um, that when you're listening to say a string line, um, you can imagine it that there's, ah, I'm hearing two, two octaves of string lines, one high, one low. And th this is uh, sometimes simply to do with the quality of the recording. This can be an, an audio only recording, uh, you know, like uh, an, an older CD or an older album. Or indeed, it, it, it can be um, uh, ripped straight from a movie that you pick up. You you get these phantoms which can fool you into thinking that there's something there that isn't. Um, and sort of like half the battle is 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 really just trying to how can I say in your mind or in your ear filter those out. And I, I think when you do it. Um, when you've got a lot of experience doing it and, and, and you're, 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 constant, you're constantly working on this type of thing, you, you, you tend to be able to recognize these things more readily than, say, I would have done perhaps like 10 years ago. Um, so the whole thing is, is, is the whole process is, is kind of like a lot, you know, a lot more mechanical and a lot faster. Um, obviously, one of the great the, the the greatest difficulty is when the music is is literally like obliterated by sound effects. Um, the man wasn't too bad because, as as I mentioned earlier, the, the Goldsmith kind of turns on the the music when it really needs it, and um, luckily, I think the music editor seemed to be relatively sympathetic and, and allows the music to to. Mm -hmm. To shine a little bit so um, you can get quite a lot of information from the audio the way it sits in the movie um, there were one or two you know sort of sticky points the, the 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 short protest scene is certainly one of those um, but you know in, in in moments like that when you've got 15 seconds of uh, something going on in the orchestra and lots of shouting and screaming and, and you sort of like traffic noise or whatever the hell it is that was going on in that scene. I can't quite remember. Um, the, the, the one thing that I, I, I could hear sort of very, very clearly um, is a, the, the trumpet line was clear, this kind of like bell tone type thing. I could hear what was going on in the percussion and I could kind of hear what was going on in, in the bass, uh, in the bass end. But so you had sort of like the framework of a cue there for those the, the, those few seconds, and the rest of you know, and 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 I came up, you know, 
against the situation with with, with the salamander. There were one or two moments there where you, know, you, you just like you literally just couldn't hear the music. The, the queue would be motoring along really, really nicely. Then there'd be a real big sort of interruption from a sound effect somewhere. And you go, well, I know what's happening there. I know what's happening there, either side. I can extrapolate from here and here to kind of sort of weave weave the parts together and hope that it's something that that, that Jerry would do. Um, and and certainly that was the case with uh, you know this uh, the, the, this protest queue. Where they think, okay, I can hear what's going on there, there, there. But what might Jerry do with the rest of it? And I think because you know being sort of somewhat familiar with the way he writes. It, it, it wasn't too difficult to fill in the gaps. Um, whether stuff like that is is wholly accurate, nobody knows, and, and you, nobody will know. <laughs> you, you bring up a good point, though, that you know we're fortunate. I think we were fortunate on the Salamander as well that there were no obvious edits and things like there there are for the chairman which is one reason why you need the actual <sighs> written score for the chairman yes, to properly quite. restore it but the salamander it the cues were all complete and it seems like they're complete at least in the man i mean at least as, as best as we can tell there are no awkward obvious edits in no. the cues and and it's also we were discussing earlier how it's spotted and i think the man is it's almost like it's a play like it's like it's, you know, the, it's a Rod Serling play that was filmed for television in terms of the focus is on the dialogue and the acting and there's not music going on at the same time under it in the traditional film score sense most of the time. Yes, it, it's like the music is kind of underscoring uh, moments of transition or actual sequences that are wordless like the Lincoln Memorial like the Oval Office when he's just looking around at the trappings of the Oval Office these hmm. are kind of the highlights and there might be some minimal sound effects but it's not like it's uh, underscoring a heavy dialogue scene or action or that kind of thing and in the most action EQ in the score is for a montage uh, showing him doing presidential stuff where it's silent. We don't actually hear the talking and the discussions of people. We see him in action. And thankfully for Goldsmith fans and for your work reconstructing this, the cue just gets to kind of play in the clear for the most part, that, yeah, that sort of thing. Uh, yes. I mean, that, 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 I mean, that, that was a real enterprise moment. You know, it, it, it's like, that's, the, that's all there is, is, is the, is the music is allowed to carry that sequence. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's great because it's, it's dialed right up, so you can you can get a lot of uh, you can get a lot of information. Um, I mean, some of the sequences you just talked about, you know, the the the, the Oval Office and the Memorial, that the, they were they were driven by the music, and you know, sometimes the recording gets a little bit cloudy, but uh, one just has to have the patience to kind of. You know, you can hear what the top trumpet is doing, and then you think, okay, so I, I can hear what the bottom trumpet is doing, but what is the middle trumpet doing? And sometimes you've just got to like have this little section on repeat and repeat and focus and focus and focus until you hear. You just need a a, a starting point, and once you've got like that that first note that maybe that second trumpet is doing, and it finally comes through. You can then sort of follow the line and and and, and piece it together. Um, so the more you listen, the the more your your brain kind of like or your ears clear out the stuff that's around, and you you can hear the line that you're wanting to hear. Um, and, and, and it especially helps to have prior experience with the composer's music as you have, like you said, a decade ago, you wouldn't have been able to maybe do it the same way or as well because now you've had this experience reconstructing the salamander reconstructing the thriller scores and other goldsmith you know even like the the dress waltz you did for silva and you've got this experience at looking at how goldsmith does things if you've got kind of the outlines of the picture so to speak yeah and you know how goldsmith usually fills it in Yes. You know, that kind of knowledge allows you to make educated guesses that are much more likely to be accurate to the yeah. original life. Uh, yes, yes. And, uh, and the other the, the other thing is, 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 is that once you get into the language and once you get into the grammar, the sound of the whole thing, um, and you, you begin to recognize certain techniques that he's using or ways that he voices chords. And then once 
it's it's a little bit like finding you know, someone's giving you a puzzle and gradually somebody is feeding you clues and mm. keys to unlock the uh, to unlock the answer and and you know so once you the, the great thing about this is uh he pretty much establishes the modus operandi of the score within that that, that main title and once i knew how he was scoring the horns and what he was doing with the trumpets etc um that made getting that main title made the whole thing a lot easier uh, much the, the the a similar situation then with the more intimate uh the, the more intimate uh, sections in the score where it goes to that uh, sort of bluesy jazzy type thing once you find a way into that and and see how he's doing it I was like, oh, okay, so he's 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 kind of okay. He's going to change up the instrumentation. Maybe the key will be different, but he's fundamentally going to do a very similar thing here, here, here. So you, know, you begin to kind of like crack the code, as it were, and 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 that 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 makes it easier. You're, you're kind of a detective finding finding the pieces. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a little bit like that. This is yeah. There's there's some detective work which uh, which goes on. You're not um, just building a bridge over a gap based on what happened earlier in the queue, but you're because you know how he develops his scores from queue to queue. You're using earlier cues as sort of legends to that map, kind of. It sounds like. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, really, there the, the, there weren't that many cases. Uh, like I said, there was literally only one case in in the man where stuff was seriously smothered by sound effects, and that yeah. was like that, that that 15, 16 second protest queue. Um, and I guess uh, hail to the chief at the end, you know, where it's like all it's an audience noise uh, or crowd mm -hmm. noise right away through throughout throughout that. But I mean, you know, again, the 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 the, the arrangement is 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 relatively simple, so one can work out what's what's going on there to um, to be able to replicate that. And it's a real famous tune, so I mean, you, you know. You don't right. arrange hail to the chief. It is what it is. Although this well, is something that I think our list of that, that, yeah. that very item. Um, I remember Lee and I went back and forth a little bit on <laughs> yeah. um, hail to the chief because um, in the key that it, Goldsmith arranges it, you know, it's a kind of a standard arrangement, but, mm. when, but it's using the orchestra that they recorded with. When you get to the end of it, if you listen to it, you can hear the French horns are taking over the last note of hail to the chief. And then they go into their own, you know, sort of that in harm's way twist, which yeah. becomes, you know, the end title. And I remember Lee and I were going back and forth and it's Lee who caught it. We're saying, do you hear violas on that as well? We were trying to determine if it's just the French horns or violas. And ultimately that's where I leave it up to Lee. It's his ear that determines, yeah, I can hear exactly where the horns are taking over. And so that's exactly what we do. We have the French horns, you know, they're in the same key. They start off on literally the same note um, as the last note of Hail to the Chief. That's so interesting, Doug. I think a lot of our listeners would assume that maybe, you know, TV movie, this is kind of source music and it maybe they just tracked in some pre-existing source music or maybe it was performed live when they were filming or something like that. But you guys actually were able to deduce that Jerry Goldsmith arranged Hail to the Chief to he actually designed oh, yeah. it to transition mm -hmm. into the end credits queue rather yeah. than there being some kind of weird edit of mashing up a source queue into the end credits. This was actually composed by Jerry to incorporate it. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. As, as, as Doug mentioned, this is this is something we, I mean, we we had quite a lengthy chat about this, and there were there were a couple of tells. The first thing is what Doug mentioned: the fact that the French horns kind of take over. You know, there's there's a segue from the end of "Hail to the Chief" into you know into your end credits, um, and then there's something which isn't really common to the piece itself, and it's that. <laughs> Almost classic Goldsmith horn counter line in the last verse of the yeah, Hail to the, the Chief. Very end of it. Yeah, yeah. Where the horns start doing their own thing. And you know, that's 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 like a classic Goldsmith ism. That's a, that's a real fingerprint. Um, so that it, it was kind of those two things that sort of pushed us into uh, you know, thinking this is this is probably his his own arrangement. Um, I, I mean, well, it also because it didn't have any violins in it either. So you get into yeah. that territory where you're realizing 
the hail to the chief that they're using in the film seems to be derived from the same instrumental forces that are being used in the score itself. Yeah, for sure. As opposed to a source cue where you'd say, well, no, because now you can hear that there's tuba parts or, you know, whatever you can hear the yeah. violins. Yeah. So, but I left that all to Lee. I just, I had brought up to him that it seems like Goldsmith's French horn writing is taking over mm. at the end of the hail to the chief. It's kind of creeping in there somewhere. Yeah. And then, Go ahead, Lee, figure out where and how. <laughs> yeah. Well, that actually it kind of proves to me Goldsmith reconstructed that hail to the chief because mm. he incorporated that horn line coming out. Oh, yeah, the all the way the last, yeah. last several bars. So that's, you know, obviously a Goldsmith arrangement. I mean, it's a easy, you know, he obviously didn't spend a whole lot of time on that piece because it's a familiar piece, but it is, it's his adaptation of it yeah. designed our, to go into his Our recording his is very good. That sounds terrific. Yeah. Yeah. They, we even have, we even have a take without it going into the French horn part. Remember? So yeah, we can right. have that as a bonus track. You're just hail to the chief. Oh, cool. Hey, hey everybody. I just want to say, Hey, Yavar, thank you yeah. for doing this. And I just wanted to, say thank you very much for having me involved with your podcast here. Oh, glad to have you. And if you want to come back sometime, Bill, you know, we'd, we'd be glad to just have you on a uh, guest appearance sometime if you want to join us on something. Yeah. That'd much. be wonderful. I think this is really important for Goldsmith fans and music fans to be a part of. So I really appreciate you having me involved with this. So I'm going to say good night and have a great day. Okay. Good night, sir. Great. You too. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for Hi, Bill. work on it. Great to see you. Yeah, I think I think a lot of fans, I think I feel so strongly about doing this because I think a lot of fans don't realize just how much work goes on behind the scenes to make something like this happen. I mean, work goes on behind the scenes for all of your normal releases too, Doug, and all the licensing and finding all the elements and everything, but it's an entirely different, you know, kettle of fish to try and tackle, you know, recreating a, a score, especially if it's something that doesn't exist in written form you know, in, and making it come alive again as music in a new, new recording. So, I mean, that's why these are so infrequent is they're so challenging and expensive. And, and I just thank you for, you know, tackling it. I know it's a, I know it's a challenge every time and uh, it's not for the faint of heart, but, but, you know, all of you are contributing in some way to this existing. And so I, I feel like the Goldsmith Odyssey needs to contribute in, in terms of both promoting it, but also recording all the work that went into it for posterity. And so that uh, other Goldsmith fans like us can really appreciate all that went into it. Um, yeah, so, so before we close up, I just want to ask some about the sessions themselves. Uh, I, know, I know we lost Bill again. He, he talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, Jeff, you you weren't able to actually attend the sessions, right? But you you got to hear them afterwards, or, or did you did you go yeah. in remotely, and uh, did you get to react, you know, to well, some of them being performed? Yes, yes, they provided the orchestra provided a live stream of the mm -hmm. recording sessions. But the thing is, that they because of the time difference, they started at like two in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I didn't watch the whole thing. But I watched a but lot you got of some it. of it. Yeah. And, you know, when you watch a recording session, there's a lot of starting and stopping and going back and rehearsing a couple measures, doing another take of this, another take of that, a pickup of this. But I mean, I could tell it was going to be a world class recording because uh, Bill Stromberg and Doug Fake and Lee Phillips and Simon Rhodes, the engineer, I mean, they were on top of it. And uh, you guys crushed it. I've I have heard the the mixes, and I am really super excited to hear the final album. Uh, I'm not super excited about the logistics of shipping them all, <laughs> 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 but I can't wait to play it. We're going to put it in an oversized box just for you, Jeff. Dude, so you can't <laughs> see. <laughs> No, with, with, with a special James Earl Jones shape of his head. So you yeah. have to come up with a special box for every order. It, it's going to be a follow-up to the uh, Verez Michael Giacchino Star Trek Deluxe Edition. 
Oh, you, you mean know, the one the, that can't that can't fit on a CD shelf? You mean that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. Except it won't even be, you know, right angles. It's, you know, Doug said James Earl Jones's head. It's gonna be, you know, yeah. yeah this, 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 yeah. <laughs> there you go. Perfect for the CD. I well, may, uh, I may have a minority opinion among collectors, but like weird size box sets are my nemesis. I hate them. <laughs> I feel the same way. Most of us do. Yeah. I, re- I I bought the new um, uh, Star Trek, the reissue, uh, because I wanted one that would fit on the shelf next to the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> same. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, I'm crazy enough. I re- Who are these re- things aimed for? They're aimed for collectors. <laughs> yeah. Who are the most anal people on the planet? <laughs> collectors so (laughs) why do you make something for collectors that they don't want (laughs) (laughs) they can't put on the shelf i mean i'm so i'm so picky i rebought a perfectly fine star trek 5 because you guys had a spine that matched the other ones next to it so you know it worked on me that's commitment Uh, yep (laughs) yeah well, it's also, you know, a beloved Goldsmith score. So, yeah. um, but, but, uh, but Jeff, just uh, before we ask what other people thought who were there in person, you know, what kind of, you know, what was your reaction to the music itself, I guess, y- hearing it performed that, you know, w- without, without, you know, it being an old cassette recording from Doug. Well, sure. And plus Black Patch, I'd never heard before. So that was just, uh, Hearing that for the first time, for the first time in this way, performed by a world-class orchestra, man, it was amazing. I actually was awake to hear that Warner Brothers Shields being recorded. And I was like, oh boy, <laughs> sign me up. And then hearing Excellent. hearing the man without having Doug hum it, it was old. <laughs> <laughs> You know, as a bonus track on the end of the CD, you could have you know, like uh, a version of the man where you mix in Doug's humming over it. And it'll be just like when Jerry was humming with Rudy, you know, it'll it'll Jerry's not with us anymore, but Doug can stand in for Jerry and and hum along with the orchestra just for you, Jeff, just so you can just have that or, nostalgic yeah. connection. It's a stretch or, goal. Yeah, yeah can right. I get, stretch goal. Can I get royalties? Yeah. Right. or we don't do that <laughs> <laughs> well that'll be saved for the special edition 10 years from now you know that's right it, the, it'll be it gets reissued for the third time yep exactly unreleased bonus where we track. actually change the spine so that we can drive <laughs> collectors upset yes, yes. <laughs> yeah uh. <laughs> okay so so now uh, Doug and Lee, you actually being there at the sessions, what was it like for you hearing this music performed live? You know, Lee, you had you had done so much with the man in particular, and according to Bill Stromberg, you you added a lot. It was a whole wholly different experience hearing your reconstruction versus the original. And so, what was it like for you as the person who reconstructed it? Well, uh, I mean, it, it was. <laughs> It was a real thrill, and it, it, it's not often that one gets the chance to be, how can I say, uh, passive uh, in a recording session. Um, normally, I'm very, very involved and, and, and certainly have been with, you know, the recording process and offering suggestions of this, that, or, or That's the other. That's not right. It should be more like this, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. y- yes, um, but... Uh, uh, Bill's interpretation was is, is 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 just so on point. It's so musical, and the 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 orchestral performance was was flawless. Um, you know, Doug was offering opinions of things which he wanted to hear, and Simon Rhodes, uh, nothing gets past his ears. Um, so if there was uh, if there was a problem with you know the uh, flute tuning or tightness with French horns and trombones, etc. He'd be on the case as soon as a, a take was done. And I, 
Uh, occasionally, Bill would ask a question, oh, should we do this, should we do that, and uh, or wanted to check that uh, a, a note was right. Um, and I was kind of just responding to any questions um, that, that were asked. Uh, uh, aside from that, I, I, I kind of just sat there and enjoyed the performance. It was just, they were the easiest sessions I think I've ever I would say ever done, but I didn't really do anything. So the easiest sessions I've ever been to, um, it was great. It, it, it was uh, it, it was a real it was a real thrill to hear to hear that stuff come uh, come to life in in such epic fashion. You know, they they, they were just such great sessions, a great atmosphere. The performance was was terrific. Um, it was everything that you could hope for from a recording experience, I, I think. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just glad that they asked me to do it. <laughs> and Doug, what was it like for you when you first heard the Royal Scottish National Orchestra performing Jerry Goldsmith's very first feature film score? Same opinion everybody else had. It was, it was pretty exciting. One of the things that helped was everybody knew what they were supposed to do and everybody's so good at what they were doing. Lee obviously being completely on top of the whole reconstructions, the notes themselves. Bill is so good with getting in front of musicians, getting musicians to respond to him. And admittedly on these two scores, I was familiar with them and I knew what I wanted to get out of the um, overall performances. So um and then, um, as Jeff brought up, we shouldn't undersell um, Simon Rhodes. For people that are not familiar, Simon Rhodes, of course, was James Horner's engineer, the way Bruce Botnick was for Jerry Goldsmith. So Simon is behind you know, Titanic, obviously, and Avatar, and Zorro, and all these James Horner scores. And uh, he knows what he's doing. Mm. So he would chime in on the things that he was concerned with, you know, mix levels, balance levels, things of that nature. Obviously, Lee would be there to correct all of the wrong notes. Um, so I had fun because at one point we were trying to determine why in one particular bar something wasn't working well. And I just chimed out. I said, well, the harp player is playing a D natural and it's supposed to be a D sharp. And everybody was silent for a second. And I was saying, oh, you know, Doug's right. You know, blah, blah, blah. So I was watching at the while. time. I remember that. <laughs> it was kind of fun. But really, it was mostly um, Bill would draw the musicians what he's looking for. He would then turn after a take and ask if there was something that I was happy or unhappy with. And I would I would point out, for example, if I thought the trombones needed to be louder or softer or whatever, but that would be the extent of mine. I would give him interpretive ideas that I was looking for. And then Simon would give his feedback in the booth, what he's hearing, because of course he's hearing all of the channels piped right into where he is. So he's really the ears that are going to determine if actually the French horns are out of tune with the trombones or there's a timing balance issues and things of that nature. But the bottom line is it's a very collaborative process, not mm -hmm. one person. Although I, I'd have to give the edge to Bill, his ability to stand in front of musicians and get from them exactly what he wants. And I've seen enough conductors and worked with enough conductors Bill really has a great rapport with musicians. He just draws for it. They pay attention. They respond. So you don't have to do too many takes where he's having to repeat himself and say, okay, cellos, that's not what I was looking for. What I was looking for was this. He can say one time what he's looking for. They listen and they respond. So basically it's a collaborative process between several people and everybody knew what they were supposed to be doing. And it just worked out really, really smoothly. So it sounds like thanks to the efficiency of everyone involved, there wasn't too much of a challenge of getting everything down and recorded in these, you know, short time spans of the recording sessions. You had, you had two sessions for Black Patch and one for The Man. And, you know, there, there wasn't a scramble at any point, you know, during that. Nothing like, um, I mean, I think you and I've talked before the, 
the most stressful I've ever seen was watching Jerry putting together Star Trek V when they were trying to get the end title down. And they had, you know, the now infamous issues with missing bars and Mm -hmm. a particular orchestrator having made some errors and some things. And it got really stressful. In this case, everything just ran so smoothly. We never really had what you would call a really stressful moment. Mm -hmm. There were um, certainly that the brass on the main title to the man, that's a fairly challenging piece to play. The trumpets are in the high register quite a bit. And you have intonation issues because they're widely spaced from the French horns and things of that nature. But the players are so good and everybody was so good at their collaborative um, contributions that we really never ran into major stress. I mean, the sessions ran smoothly. We got everything done. We were even able to go back at the end of the Black Patch sessions and do a couple takes to clean up some things that we were concerned we wouldn't have time to get done earlier. But the timing worked out. We got everything done. Nice. Oh, neat. Uh, And something else I wanted to ask you about, Doug, is uh, you shared, uh, or on the Kickstarter, I believe, was shared this extended version of the final cue, the finale cue in Black Patch that was extended. Can you can you talk about how that came about? Because that seems like it's going to be a really cool bonus to have sort of a, a concert almost treatment of this gorgeous theme that Jerry wrote. Yeah, in fairness, um, actually, that was going to be a surprise for people. Um, no, no you, the, you, uh, you shared it. You I know what we were, on social media. What we talked about, and this is not a criticism, but anybody who's watched the man notices at the ending of the film, at the ending of the end, you know, it's a brief end title, but the last thing you hear is a very truncated sound. It's a bum, 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 like that, and it, it cuts off. And some people have always thought, is that really how Jerry wrote it? It just kind of cuts off that. For Mm -hmm. a composer of his talent, that just seems kind of weak, if you will. And uh, having all the scores, the actual scores now in front of us, we were all able to say, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, that Jerry starts to develop that love theme, which really is the highlight of the score. Because like I said, it's it's not a happy love theme. It's a a tragic, it's a a pretty tragic film overall. Mm -hmm. It's a tragic love theme. So it's very sad. You know, it's a minor key theme. And um, he starts to develop at the ending and all of a sudden it builds and it just kind of hits this sort of French horn line and then it bum, 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 in the timpani and you're going, yeah, that's really Jerry ended it that way. So actually I had talked to Lee about this idea. I said, you know, Lee, that a, the love theme is such a highlight and it almost feels like Jerry would have gone a little further because he introduces it at the end, but mm-hmm. you know, there's only so many seconds of the picture left. And so I had suggested to him, and, and I talked about this with Bill as well, and we were all in sync. What about Lee? Is there a way you could uh, you know, kind of adapt that ending a little bit, not rewrite it, but is there a way you can kind of just develop the, that love theme just a little more? And then instead of just ending bum, 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 you know, on the timpani, is there something we can do? And bless his heart, Lee wrote not only an extension of that love theme, which fits in the idiom of Goldsmiths, but also then came up with an ending so that you get that bump, and then you get a couple more bars after that. And um, on paper, it just looked magnificent. I mean, it was a cool idea. And in fact, mm-hmm. just to let you know, Lee, I didn't realize that those trombone chords that you introduce when you kind of goes to a G major chord uh-huh. and there's these trombones that are introduced on the low end. Yes. Uh, that's an incredible sound. I mean, just it, it that gave me goosebumps <laughs> the first time I heard it, but anyhow, and then when we were doing the sessions, we were all, and we did this live right there. We, we were all thinking, okay, that's, that's the finish to this score because it really just kind of finishes out what Jerry appeared there either wasn't time. Obviously, we can't go into his head. But he was at the mercy of the film. And the film ends so abruptly. You know, I guess yep. he, he, he had to he do just, the same with the score. So 
Um, but one of the joys of having a non-stressful recording session is we had a we did the ending as Lee in, included. I, I hesitate to say adapted because it's almost like Lee got inside Jerry's head and said, you know, if Jerry had 20 more bars, you know, the time, here's what he would have done. And it came out so well. But so we have a final chord, which has literally like a fermata over it, where, you know, hold, and it swells and crescendos, and then we it's over. And then we talked about this idea of actually adding to that yet a third version, which would end more with the Jerry's idea of bum, 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 ending, but it would be with the Lee's additional bars included into it. And uh, I have to admit, I don't know if all of these are going to be on our finished album. We think it would be kind of a nice idea to give people a chance to hear, you know, Jerry's original film version, of course, mm -hmm. but that is the weakest. It really is in terms of this splendid piece of 35 minutes of music. That's the weakest because it just quits or we could do lee's version one which is a really really powerful ending and then we could do a third version because we've got it on tape now which uses jerry's kind of truncated idea but with lee's extension of it so i mean everybody i, mean, I have vote to wait. for all three doug but if you're only going to put two on this version there's always that 10th anniversary one then you can stick the the third one on there too <laughs> or you can stretch right. fill your next release and say we'll add the third version onto uh <laughs> our next t omkin disc yeah, or we or we can keep newly remastered with one additional bonus track <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly so uh <laughs> are there any other anecdotes uh from the sessions that any of you can share like any any memorable moments or parts of the experience interactions with musicians during a break or or anything at all uh if you have anything else you can share with us uh, memories of that that would be wonderful there's one scary moment if that matters that was sure, on sure. the very first session you know we had these three sessions they're all booked scheduled the players are all there um but our principal clarinetist wasn't there for our, yes. our very first session and the black patch has a lot of clarinet in it. So uh -huh. it was, um, we kept coming up with trying to go, all right, let's go to this cue because it doesn't require the principal clarinetist. And then we'd get it down and it's on tape. Then we'd all look around. Is he here yet? And we kept saying, no, he's still <laughs> stuck in traffic. All right, well, <laughs> let's find this cue. So we kept recording cues out of what we had originally intended simply to try and work around the fact that, you know, if this principal clarinetist doesn't come, I mean, I admit I'm sitting over where I'm sitting saying, oh my God, $60,000 down the drain. You know, how are we going to explain to people? Well, maybe Lee can recreate it using one of his synth pads and we can actually <laughs> recreate the clarinet parts. But it was kind of scary because it wasn't just a couple minutes late. We yeah. were well into the entire first session waiting for principal clarinetist to show up. Yeah, so it, took, you, it, it took an hour, I think. Yeah, oh, poor guy was just. Stuck I, I've, I've never run into that before. I've, I mean, every recording session I've ever attended, all the players are there. They're they're in their chairs. It, yeah, it, it, it's was, expensive. It costs a lot of money. He was worth you know. the wait. <laughs> it was. He was worth. It. We had yeah. a lot of cues in Black Patch that didn't require the, the clarinet. So, <laughs> you know, but we were yeah. beginning to, after an hour, we were starting to run out of what can we do yeah that's right we did all the string cues and yeah. uh, a couple other cues like with trombones and timpani and all that stuff but yeah i was actually starting to get worried because the clarinet <laughs> plays through that whole score mm. <laughs> so did you actually run out of cues before he showed up that you could no, do without luckily clarinet? we took a break we, we, yeah and literally he showed up during the break and he sat right down and joined in so we were fine Oh, that's great. Every everybody yeah. was fine except for Doug, because of course he's the guy sitting there thinking in terms of <laughs> the, the costs of it, how we're gonna explain to our Kickstarter audience. Well, it's almost authentic, except for the clarinet part. You know, this <laughs> oh, no, no, no. thousand dollars we can record the clarinet. 
<laughs> the clarinet was so important on that score. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it literally has the harmonies like Copeland, you know, where the flute would have the melody and the clarinet has the harmony underneath and all that stuff. So I even really, asked really Bill if, if... But boy, Bill that guy, he sure clarinet. apologized when I showed up or when I went outside and he showed up. He was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, boy. He was so... <laughs> He was so afraid. <laughs> he was just stuck he in he traffic. He really or something? Us all down. Yeah, that's what he said. He was stuck in traffic. You, they, uh, uh-huh. Doug, you were starting to say something. Oh, I'm I'm not a sure. Moment, I, I may have go. said I was going to go up to Bill and ask. I mean, Bill's such a talented musician. I was going to ask him, "Can you play clarinet?" Because if you <laughs> could, we'll we'll come back here, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. and um, then we'll have Bill overdub the clarinet part. So yeah, is that I, the only? I, Go ahead. I Bill. can play middle C on a clarinet. Yeah, yeah. I can do that. <laughs> yeah, I can actually play a scale. <laughs> well, that was uh, really the only stressful thing. Other other than that, and, and even that stress was relatively manageable because we had a lot of cues that didn't require principal clarinet, so mm-hmm. we were able to get by for that whole first hour. But you were hoping originally to record them in in film order. Is that what it was? I, I think Jerry usually or operated a, or that a way. little different. Well, I, actually, I'm not sure Jerry did that as much. Most of the time, the idea is you have an A orchestra, which is you know the largest group, because mm-hmm. it's it's all based on the economics. And then you right. have a B orchestra, which is a smaller group, which where you don't require the brass, for example, and sometimes the C orchestra and things. And usually the cues are recorded just for economic reasons, i.e. all of the big stuff in a session and then the smaller orchestra sessions have their own sessions and things like that. So you're not paying for a whole bunch of players just sitting out on the floor. Well, in this case, we kind of were because I asked you if we could just keep everyone around in case we wanted to come revisit cues. So, but my goal was to record the whole score in film order. And that didn't work out because of the clarinet player. Right. But right. Um, remember, it actually worked to our benefit because um, by keeping everyone around still, at the remember, we finished a half hour early on each session. We, we could have done more, you know, like. Yeah, and and I, um, I talked you into going back and recording the fight music again. Ex- exactly. A, and that's in, my. In a single take. That's my point. We ended up going back and doing the fight music in one take. And so Simon, the recordist, didn't have to go cut it up and create a right. performance. We actually right, had right. the whole performance in one take it, because yeah, we had that they extra half takes. hour at the end. So, yeah. Yeah, so I originally you recorded it in sections. Well, Normally, we had, the, well, we had this well, conversation over, um, I, I, Bill knew this already, but we had a conversation over, um, over when we recorded Jason the Argonauts in London and Bruce Bryant, we were working on the skeleton fight music, you know, where there's a whole bunch of skeletons now fighting Jason. And we had talked about when we were recording the piece, Bruce came back into the booth at one point and said, Doug, look, we can go over this again if you want um, and clean up every wrong note because it's a very hard piece to perform. And he said, or you can do a take where the players just go for it. And you let him let him go, and you're going to get some some the French horn's going to miss his highest note, but what you're going to have is a flow of energy because they're really going for it. They're not playing it in bars and pieces. Mm-hmm. And uh, great so point. I, no, I, no, I just I had talked to Bill because the fight music in Black Patch was well, complicated. It was more complicated mm-hmm. than when you're listening to it in the film scenes. I just remember we ended up with takes multiple takes which simon was going to put together and then i kept saying to bill you know if we could just find the time to do one take where you giving the kind of energy you can do on the podium and we get a a take they may not be clinically accurate with every note but i think you can get this drive because it's it's the key action cue in the picture if you do what you do we'll end up with just one take with all of the energy and stuff you put into it. And I believe Simon used that whole take that we did right, at the right. end of the that's, session. Yes. Yeah, and what we had I couldn't believe to all of the percussion players and brass and everyone sat around waiting for us to finish the session. I said, we're going to redo the action piece. Right. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, okay. So all the percussionists had to wake up and the 
<laughs> you had to be layers. asleep for and two we, hours. I mean, we it, literally it, did. We did two takes of it, and the second take, they were perfect. Yeah, and, and I would, think that's what's on the album. It, it was quite remarkable because I we, we'd spent some time on on. Well, I was say we spent some time. Bill spent some time on that queue uh, in d- d- during during the earlier part of the day. Um, that's right. And uh, and I I remember I remember you saying it's just like ah oh, man I, I'm I'm not like one hundred percent convinced that the, 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 that the energy was there for you or, or something right. felt a little off. So anyway. Um, uh, it, they said that they suddenly then decided that they were going to do this. Uh, they were going to redo the fight queue at the at, at the tail end of the session, and the the difference really was palpable. I mean, it it was yeah. it was astonishing. Um, uh, that the, they just pulled up this piece of music. It, it's almost as though. You know, by uh, I I don't know what, but something maybe had been working in the players' minds subconsciously. They were getting more and more into the vibe of the score and how things should run, and they just they just went for it. And I was like, "Shit, where did that come from?" Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was it was just it was magic. And then they did it again. It it, it was though that you know the, the the process that they'd gone through throughout the day gradually acclimatizing to the way this music should be performed and they just blasted through this the, the, this fight queue at, at, at the end of the session and mm-hmm. it, it was like it was one of those situations where just everybody just just like stops and looks at one another and says oh 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 we'll use that one then yeah <laughs> that's, that's actually what simon said at the session he goes i think we'll we'll lose we'll use that one <laughs> yeah yeah it, it was just super it was it was magic so i guess that was a clue uh cue that didn't have clarinet in it if it was done early in the sessions ah not that early oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no that one had everybody yeah, yeah oh yeah. this was the other oh okay this was the oh this was the second session i guess yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. gotcha gotcha well that's that's great that's great to know that uh, Bill's efficiency with the orchestra, you <laughs> well, know, resulted in the ability to have that extra half an hour at the end where you could devote it to really nailing some of the more complex stuff in the score. Oh, I yeah, guess you, that's a good point, isn't it, Doug? <laughs> yeah, well, and it's also I, Bruce. Bruce had really made a good point, and it would, you know, this Bruce Broughton had made a really good point. It's that I mean, that's what these players do. They play music. Um, but film music is unique in that it's being timed to the frame on a picture and often is being recorded in fragments and bars and stuff. And then music editors later cut this stuff together. And uh, Bruce was talking about sometimes, because they're professionals, it, it, two minutes of music is a fair amount of music to perform. And so the idea is sometimes if you get them to a certain level of proficiency on it, then the best thing to do is to just let them go for it for two minutes. You don't stop them. You don't, you don't edit in these two bars from this performance and that one. Instead, it's the two minutes that they play music and that's what they do. And, you know, with a little bit of luck, sometimes you get a really small number of mistakes and a really grand number of really great musical dynamics out of it. And it's just, I kept mentioning to Bill throughout that th- that last session, I kept saying, I really think we should do that with the fight. And Bill said, well, you know, if we have time and things of that nature, yes. and time worked out. And then yeah. uh, after Bill did it, well, I enjoy it. Do you, you remember... Do you remember we went to lunch and I said, I don't think we did that fight scene good enough. And I I kept telling you, everyone around me, no, we got to, I want to go back and redo that. Do we have time? Mm. And luckily we had time at the end. And I said, yes, now we can do it proper. Like, and I'm just going to go for it. And it, it worked out really well. Hey, also remember Doug on the man, the same thing happened. Ah, we let finished. him loose. Yeah, it's yes. when we were talking. We, we finished. We were talking we, about that scared zone. We kept. Talking we finished about- a half hour early on the man as well. It was the same thing as the fight scene in Black Pack. Yeah, so you're, abs- you're absolutely. Redo the action cues at the end. There was that should be just a, a sudden, policy. Yeah, yeah it, it, there was. Same thing happened. Um, exactly yeah. the same thing happened on day two. 
Uh, Bill did uh, the, the the montage cue, uh, the, the the five eight thing, and yeah. you know he, 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 we we got some really really good coverage, um, and certainly enough to put together you know to to edit together a, a really really good performance. But Bill was like, I ah, know again this this thing about the energy or the feel of it. That's right. Um, so uh, he did exactly the same thing at the end of the session, and again the orchestra just they just clicked with it. Yeah. Yeah, all of a sudden the right tempo, everything. Yeah. It just felt right. Yeah. Yeah, it just uh, fell into place. It was great. Jeff, Jeff, you'll get a kick out of this because we've talked about that cue many times in the office and stuff. But we do Bill does the very first take and then he turns to me and asks if I had any particular thoughts. And I said, um, I just uh bass trombonist if he could be a little louder because he plays on the beat <laughs> and so bill does an interpretation of it like that i'm sitting and saying, oh god this is incredible and then as soon as we're done simon Rhodes speaks over his loudspeaker he goes okay everything first of all i think the bass trombonist a little too much uh -huh. <laughs> I, was, I was so dis <laughs> it was like oh wow there that's exactly that. how it went down you're mm -hmm. you're the boss, Doug. You can put a you can put an alternate performance on there, like you did with Wall of Fire on uh, on Rio Conchos. I mean, this sounds like a similar case where in Rio Conchos you had the smooth, you know, perfect Wall of Fire, like Jerry liked, <clears throat> but you wanted the the take that had more energy and spontaneity to it, even if it was a little rougher. So that's yeah. you know. That's something that when you when you revisited the album later, you put them both on there and, you know, it, people, depending on their taste, get to pick which whether they agree with you or whether they agree with Jerry, I guess. Well, in general, it always seems like a nice idea to offer both versions. But, yeah, that's an example where um, had Jerry, bless his soul, if he had still been with us, mm -hmm. not, he would have said, Doug, take that off the album. <laughs> <laughs> too much face trombone <laughs> well uh you know doug i didn't want to ask you the last time you recorded a jerry goldsmith score was over 32 years ago and it was another western rio conscious with jerry himself conducting and you told us um when we spoke with you before about it that he seemed to really enjoy revisiting his early work at that point so i'm wondering if you can imagine maybe what his reaction to black patch getting a new recording uh for its premiere album release would have been can you i mean when you were there at the recording session did you did you ever imagine jerry next to you <laughs> commenting on it did you hear his voice in your head at any point um yeah of course because i mean he and i worked on so many things together mm -hmm. um um admittedly not to be on the spot because bill does such a good job with the orchestra Bill missed. You were gone when I was speaking. Your ability to get musicians to respond to you oh. is unlike anybody else I've ever seen. Um, oh wow! Okay, yeah. but you know, um, you know that that's just a fact. Um, in watching Jerry work with orchestras, um, Jerry's the consummate composer. I, there's not a composer that can out outright him. Um, in front of an orchestra, I think he knows what he wants. I never got quite the same feeling that he, he gets what's in his head translated to a room full of 80 musicians. I don't know, because my kind of conducting I've conducted is really ham and egger. I mean, it's musicians are lucky if they can even find my downbeat. So I don't know. Bill can communicate with the orchestra so well. But... Um, Sometimes. I do recall the Rio Concho sessions in particular because Jerry would come back into the booth and so often he was excited about what he was doing, which is not the way Jerry generally was, especially looking backwards on his music. And he would come back and he would make comments about, you know, that's a good cue, Doug. I really do like that. So I got the impression at Rio Concho anyway um, remember, this is pretty early. Jerry hadn't really gone back and re-recorded any of his film scores, except yeah. for Islands of the Stream for us a little bit earlier. So yes. this is still fairly early for Jerry to go back and take a look at one of his earlier works. And uh, he and I had spent time, because I kept talking to him about, this is sort of like 
the first example of you doing this particular kind of action writing or this kind of snare drum writing and some things like that. And so when he was actually recording Rio Contos, he was coming back and I think he kept some of that in mind and he was, he saw I was enthused, so he was enthused. And it helped because we had, of course, Bruce Botnick in the booth. You know, we were willing to pay to get Bruce there. And wow. their, their rapport, of course, is um, pretty incredible. So Jerry would come back and Bruce would make comments. Boy, that French, those French horns, that's really something, Jerry. Well, all of this combined made Jerry really excited about doing it. So watching Bill do Black Patch, most of the time I thought, uh, I have no feedback. Bill's on top of it. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if Jerry would have done this the same way. And I'm sure Bill thought the same thing because Bill was so conscious about, you know, it's one thing for me to conduct Bernard Herman or Franz Waxman, but here I am conducting Jerry Goldsmith. It's my first Jerry Goldsmith mm -hmm. and his fans are all over the map. They're so picky about everything. So Bill was very concerned about, you know, I wonder, I mean, I'm doing Jerry Goldsmith here. I mean, this is my first Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, am, am I going to do this correctly? And I kept saying, <laughs> yeah, you will. Anyhow, I don't know. Out of that mishmash of comments, the point being, it's kind of hard not to watch Bill conducting Black Patch and thinking, I wonder what Jerry would have been doing if he was here. You know, can he, would he approve of this? Would he be involved? But I'm also having to admit, Jerry didn't really like to go back and look at his older music. He didn't like but he did in Rio Conchos it. and uh, the artist who did not want to paint you. You told us how much he loved doing that at the time. So, I mean, to I wonder if for him, that's it's... really the only time he did that. I, I didn't get the impression listening to his re-recordings of Sam Pebbles, for example, or Patton, mm -hmm. that he must have gotten all that excited. I don't know. I wasn't mm -hmm. there. I can only listen to the final results. And I, in my opinion, and of course, it's a weighted opinion here, but I think the Rio Contos is the best re-recording that Jerry ever got. I agree. You know? Yeah. And, and the artist who did not want to paint. Well, well right. Yeah, of course, exactly. yeah, you yeah. are 100%. And one thing that we hear from, one thing we hear from Bruce that, uh, that Jerry would have probably done is go back and re-record that action cue as one full take. He liked recording complete takes whenever he could for exactly the reason you guys talked about getting there you go. some life into the performance and it i mean look what happened when you did it yeah when he we just, when we were when we were doing artists who did not want to paint he made a point of coming um over to me which i mean i obviously felt honored because you know this is pretty early in our labels history too but he came over and he said, Doug, what do you think? I want to do this whole, you know, the entire piece, you know, however long it is, 13 minutes or whatever. So I want to do this all in one take. And then, I mean, I'm pretty inexperienced at this point, but I made a point of saying, you know, well, there's eight French horns. There's a, a lot of French horn in this queue. I mean, you're going to get some mistakes, right? And then I'm thinking, I'm telling Jerry Goldsmith this, but he goes, you know, yeah, I think, I want to get the feel. I want the musicians to get into it for the entire piece. Then we'll go back and we'll do pickups and we'll repair all the, all the places where there were, were mistakes. And it was my first chance of really getting a chance to see um, what Bruce, Bruce Broughton had been talking about. Sometimes going for the musicality and letting the players do what they're, what they're trained to do. You get them to play it through, and then you can go back, I guess, and you can take bars and fix things, but somehow you get an energy because they're playing a piece of music now. They know they're not just gonna play bars one through eight and stop, you know, they're getting to play the entire piece. And it's not unusually Before long. We, we, I just got to talk about just a freewheeling conversation about Poltergeist with composer Leanna Premiani. And so I was reading the old liner notes and there's a 16 minute track called let's get her rebirth and rebirth is the last half of that. And Mike Medicino notes in his, in his notes that, that rebirth was performed, you know, almost a full eight minute section from beginning to end without a break. And that that's Perfect. what they used. You know, a similar, and you, you can feel that music. That's not an action cue. It's a very different kind of a cue, but my gosh, it's wonderful. And it's complex. So yeah, that's and talking. 
Go ahead. You are. Sorry. No, you no. Go ahead. Finish your thought, David. I think I was. <laughs> well, talking of Simon Rhodes, I mean, that was James Horner's usual approach as well. He would do what, a, you know, a 15 minute cue, <laughs> something yep. insane in, in Willow or, or uh, Land Before Time and do it all in one take. I mean, that's that's an extreme well, the right unusual there, thing but. of James, though, um, was also that he would um, do an entire cue because he, he liked the idea of writing long cues. You know, he was not, to my knowledge, I'm not an expert, but to my knowledge, he wasn't that big on trying to catch little specific individual details. Maybe if it's an animated film and it's necessary, but often he's writing an emotional line that he'll take a starting point and an ending point and, and write what he feels is going to carry the weight of that scene's emotion. And he would do that in whole takes. But when he would go back to fix parts, he would still do the entire cues and entire takes. So That's what I've have, heard too. <laughs> yeah, so we would get these masters to um, scores of his and you know, they take 30 rolls of tape because a single cue that runs, say, four and a half, five minutes. So that's a pretty decent length cue, but it would be on there 10 times. It wouldn't be there's two or three takes of it, and then there's a couple pickups and things like that. It would be that same cue performed again and again and again and again. And then what he would apparently would do in the uh, post-production stages is have all of these complete takes and he'd pull the sections out of each of those complete takes, but it still have this musical flow to it. So the overall cue would be amazingly musical. You know, it, it, it something that um, in my opinion, it was pretty unusual way to record this stuff. And, you know, his, even his, uh, I, I, I love a lot of Horner. There are people who, who don't, but even those, who aren't where he's not one of their favorite composers recognize that that objectively one of his skills was was emotion that that was that was James one of the qualifiers of James Horner's music is it is always very emotional and it sort of makes sense because you guys were talking about about redoing this cue all the way through and it having some emotion behind it and rebirth from poltergeist is an incredibly emotional cue. And it seems like that's part of what you get is it stops being mechanical and becomes, as you're saying, more musical, or maybe as I would say, more emotional, more sort of more felt, you know, Doug, actually, I'm glad you, you said something I've always wanted to ask and haven't had the opportunity to, uh, because when I was talking with, with Leanna Premiani last month, she said she, commented like you did that you know she says these are these are concert performers playing a whole piece is not unusual for them if you do the second movement of beethoven's ninth symphony in concert you're playing the whole piece and i've always wanted to ask why is it broken up into eight bars four bars two bars and and i you said it earlier it's because of the timing really is that the main reason why they're recorded that way because it's so hard to time at length it, but it economics is probably the overriding factor in, in recording sessions, period. And if you take something that's a, a long piece of music, invariably, take Beethoven's Ninth, whatever, invariably, there are a whole lot of bars where certain musicians are not playing. And in recording sessions, especially for film, I mean, you're not just recording a piece of music for an album. You know, you're recording, the recording sessions are a very, just one part of the entire filmmaking process. And so economics say that if you have a cue that runs eight minutes, but the first four, four minutes of it don't require any brass at all. Well, often that cue is broken up into at least two parts. And the part that requires everybody that's recorded on day two or whatever with all these musicians, but the half that only required the strings and woodwinds, for example, that could be recorded on a totally different day with a much smaller wow. group of musicians. And that's, that's all for economics because um, when you hire an orchestra, you have to pay players by the session, 
by the hour per session. You can't have, they're here for the first hour and then they get to go home. They're, they're there for a session or they get paid for that whole session. Right. So part of what a contractor does is set up, if you're going to record for four days or six days or whatever, he sets up the sessions based on what music requires, what number of players, and it's all economically mapped out. Not always, but that's a key factor in the filmmaking process. It's fascinating. It wouldn't have occurred to me that, I mean, it would have occurred to me that certain cues might be on certain days, but I never would have thought certain parts of cues might also be on separate days. That's quite an insight. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just based, I mean, not always, but it's usually sure. based on economics. I mean, otherwise, if you're in a session where you only need to brass, we did that on Ivanhoe. We ran into a situation where we're going to need six trumpets for some fanfares. And it was my learning process of being told, look, you can pay those guys to sit back there in their chairs. There's six guys, but they're not even needed for three hours of the session recordings. Or you can have a separate session with just those guys, even though you have to pay them now for a whole session, you're only playing six players as opposed to all of the orchestra, or what number is involved in a particular cue, just sitting around. While they play. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's usually it, it's usually based on ep economics. It's, you know, mm -hmm. how much money do you want to spend on each session? And, uh, you know, I mean, we're willing to pay for all the correct number of musicians. We'll cover all of that. But it still makes certain amount of sense that you have in your sessions, you know, they're mapped out so that you're maximizing the amount of, of time. If for no other reason, if you only have three, three or six trumpets playing on a cue um, and you have a room with 80 other players, you're asking for a lot of room noise. You know, even if they're all mm. sitting perfectly still, a string right. player may accidentally bump his, you know, G strings, anything can happen. So, <laughs> you know, you're better off if you're going to have a small number of players on a particular cue or part of a cue, get as few musicians in that room as possible during that session. That's fascinating. So did you have something to add? I, I saw you, um, started to answer David's question too. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and well, just remember it's different when you're recording just for an album. I yeah. mean, because for an album, you're not going to deal with the music editors and the editorial departments sure. doing th their part of it. And you're also not talking about if it's a picture they're spending 70 or $80 million on and they've carved out, 1 million for the music budget. And that includes the hall and the, you know, copyist fees and all of that. I mean, when you're recording for an album, I mean, you can make like Bill was saying, he wanted to record black patch in the score order. Um, you can make some decisions like that for musicality, musicality reasons, because you're not worrying about the overall $80 million budget of the picture and things of that nature yeah. anymore. Yeah. Very good. Before point. we sign off, uh, I just want to open the floor to anybody, uh, Jeff, uh, Lee, Bill, Doug, if if any of you have any questions you want to ask each other or comments to make, you know, the floor is yours. We've got, you know, a video recording now, so I don't think we're all going to like talk over each other. But if any of you have any questions you want to ask, um, you know, or or comments you want to make to to anyone else, please feel free. When can we do this again? <laughs> <laughs> we need to get back to Glasgow and record something else. We definitely when, do. When COVID is over, because the hassles of getting to the UK from here. <laughs> is COVID ever going to be over? <laughs> that's the question. Do we wait yeah. that long? <laughs> well, it's all over the UK. Um, if, that's what, if that's what you mean. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, but, Probably uh, one, one general comment I would make to your listening audience you mm -hmm. are, is I get so many suggestions from people of what to record. Um, and um, Bill and I, on our own, we have had so many conversations where the <laughs> two of us get on the phone and then our... Or Four anybody hours. in the room, they, yeah, they just anybody in the room just leaves because he and I are just gonna go. We're we're singing the harmony parts to various means. You, you name <laughs> exactly. it, exactly. <laughs> but it, it, we we do think alike. But there, it, there's just 
really an endless number of projects that it would be fun to do. Whether it's, a, a you know, we talk about Captain from Castile because there's still never been any definitive stereophonic recreation of the entire score. Okay, but that takes a lot of money and expense and time to put together. That then would be a somebody big starter. Oh yeah, but, but other people say, wow, there's these three episodes of Gunsmoke that Jerry Goldsmith wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you think, OK, so it's just three episodes of Gunsmoke. No, it requires the same amount of research and energy mm -hmm. to put together and hire the orchestra and, and you know, the logistics. And that when you do run into, um, as Jeff was pointing out, if um, or Roger, I guess, was pointing out. If only 400 people are going to respond to the Kickstarter on Jerry Goldsmith's very first film score, how many people are going to respond if we say we're re-recording three never-before-heard episodes of Gunsmoke? And uh, mm. so what you really end up with is um, it's up to the people who support this music to finance it, to get it get it done if somehow miraculously people would step up to the plate with millions of dollars or we could get grants you know i mean you can get grants to do all sorts of stuff but can you get a grant to go and record you know three episodes of Gunsmoke? i i don't it, it might know. depend what country you live in because i know that a lot of uh orchestras in other countries this is how a lot of classical recordings come out on noxos and other labels for the most obscure composers you know this composer no one's ever heard of you know in 200 years how where does the money come from to record two of their symphonies for an album well there are a lot of things i don't know if it works on film music um it maybe does stuff i've been in, part of that <laughs> yeah yeah I, so so i don't know how it works the same way in terms of expenses you know i'm sure it's easier with stuff not in the public domain the stuff that is in the public <laughs> domain it's probably easier but um i mean well, i know that, that there are a lot of things in place go ahead a, a, a big part of it of course is film music one area i think it's kind of unique and when i say film I'm, I'm, you know music for television and film and radio um, in general, it's only written for a single performance. I mean, its original intent is to be chopped, diced, edited, recorded, and you know, put into a say a picture, black patch. That was the purpose of it. Great it wasn't point. really designed to be somebody to manage the scores and all the individual parts, every page of the first violinist part for every cue. There was never really an intent for that. So you're really at the mercy of whether studios found room for it to store all that massive amount of paper and stuff and that kind of stuff with, with just those logistical things. It means if Bill and I say, hey, let's go back and record three episodes of Gunsmoke it's pretty safe to assume, well, it's not like you just go to your local library. Yeah, I'd like to rent the <laughs> scores to Whispering Tree, you know, from Gunsmoke. Yeah, okay, they're all over here. You know, you may find the bassoon part missing, but I think it's all right over there. You know, you're really talking about just logistically. It's a massive amount of work to do. So it doesn't matter whether it's just a TV episode or whether it's, you know, Captain from Bastille, there's just a lot of logistical work involved, which means mm -hmm. cost. So it isn't as easy as why don't you guys record this? And then why not this? And why not that? And why not that? You know? And, you know, Jerry makes it more difficult for you, too, because like Bernard Herrmann, he would do um, a different orchestral makeup, instrumental makeup for each score for the same series. Like, each of his Gunsmoke scores has a different orchestra. Each of his Dr. Kildare scores has a different orchestra and sound. So many other composers working in Hollywood, I think, would say, hey, I'm working on the same TV series. I'm going to make I'm going to use roughly the same orchestra and have the same approach to things. But uh, Jerry was like uh, Herman in that he would have a, a fresh approach to each and every one. So each of those six Gunsmoke scores that he wrote had an entirely different sound to it. The two scores we just recorded have two different orchestras. Yeah, of and course. It, I remember when Lee called up and said, hey, Doug, I don't hear any violins on the man. He goes, I don't either. You know, I think violas are the highest string part. Uh-oh. 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 We lost. We lost. Oh. Is Doug gone? 
I don't know. He froze. Uh-oh. But but he was dead on with that. It's all these different TV shows. That's what makes it troublesome to record all this stuff because you have all the different orchestras involved, you know, and you, you try and do a recording session with brass and then with only strings. And mm. so it makes it troublesome. But anyway, it's like, it's, 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 it's all great though, man. But I, have you ever noticed that um, Goldsmith's score for the man it, I, I, I kind of had a feeling like all the, the brass fanfare kind of stuff kind of reminded me of uh, Logan's Run, you know, like that he did years later. Ah, yes. Um, the one have cue you, sounds... Have you thought about some of that stuff? Like, I'm just uh, curious. When I've been listening to it, I'm pretty sure you can hear remnants of uh, or foreshadowing of the monument and stuff like that. Exactly. In, uh, Definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. In in terms of the, the 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 grammar of it, the language, it's yeah. Uh, and I I only uh, it's it's weird you should say that because I've been listening as as I said to the albums quite uh, the the scores quite a lot, and every time uh, I I can't remember which one it is where it's Lincoln Memorial or Oval yes, Office. Yes, Lincoln but, Memorial. Ah, yeah. When that cue yeah. comes on, I immediately hear Logan's Run. Me too. Yep. Oh. So we are so definitely you, on the right track here. Oh, yeah, so yeah. you yeah. guys hear a connection between his two Lincoln Memorial yes. cues? Yes. So 1972, ah. Goldsmith does the score for The Man. But later on in 1976, when he does, or five, when he does Logan's Run, he has the same kind of imperial, beautiful quality, kind of probably remembering what he did for The Man when he wrote the score. So anyway, that's my own concept. I'm not saying it's. <laughs> perpendicular flat fact but that's what i think it anyway. sounds good to me yeah, you know this I, past... did i disappear there yeah you, you did. did doug but yeah, you, yeah, you finished did. a word so i think it'll it'll still be salvageable and and bill picked up on it but they were just uh, talking about the the lincoln memorial cues in the man versus uh logan's run being having similarities in them yeah um you think <laughs> yeah. yeah no no it's it's obvious the the harmony, uh, the harmonies and the melodies and and the, all the tonality and and I well, think I think when, the emotional it it they're both filmed in a very similar way. Exactly, that's what from I, the hmm. reaction of the the characters, whether it's you know Michael York, Jenny Agatha, or James Earl Jones coming across something that we all know is very symbolic, and the camera exactly. panning into it. Yeah. You know, when he would you know, complain the cool about thing- the temp tracks, when people would use his music as a temp track, his problem is he knows what he scored that for. He makes very strong associations between what he's written and what he wrote it for. So it would make perfect sense that four years later he would see the Lincoln Monument, as you say, Doug, filmed in the same way, and he would have some of the same musical musical responses, if you will. Exactly. Well, that's his vernacular. That's that's yeah. that's what he emotionally responds to. You know, the cool thing uh, is just this past week, I had a conversation one on one interview with Mike Davis, uh, a, a retired uh, U.S. Air Force chief arranger. And he actually took Jerry Goldsmith on a tour of Washington, D.C. and the Lincoln Monument, and Jerry saw it for the first time. This was immediately after he had scored Logan's Run. So he did both Logan's Run and The Man without actually having visited the Lincoln Monument. But then immediately after doing it for Logan's Run, he visited the the, uh, monument in between the Logan's Run sessions and the Omen sessions, which he was making a stopover in Washington, D.C., in between those two. And uh, Mike Davis told me about being Jerry Goldsmith's tour guide, taking him to all the sites, and Jerry Goldsmith commented to him, hey, I just wrote music for this. (laughs) You know, (laughs) yeah, so... You know, he had just he had just completed Logan's run and then he was seeing in person this this uh, this site that he had scored twice dramatically, you know, in, in the few years before. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> That's brilliant. All right. Well, any uh, any last comments or, or questions from anyone else? Jeff, do you want to jump in? Uh. 
The only question I have is this, the fight scene in uh, Black Patch, is that pretty much like the first large scale action cue that Jerry wrote? Yes. That's cool. the short answer. I would imagine yeah. it probably is. And it's, it's, film. it's, it's written at a tempo of metronome 130. And here I was going off on all the slow tempos for the action right. music on other scenes, but but this one was written at 130. And so it's like bada bada bum 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 bum. And it even kind of uh foreshadows what he'll do later on with uh oh you hear total recall. Total recall, section. yeah, total recall. There's a, a whole well, section, four or five bars where you go, wait a second, that is total recall right there. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I'll say, say, Jeff, if you want to, you might be rewarded by exploring some of Jerry Goldsmith's earlier radio scores. Um, a lot of his live TV scores are lost. I mean, the programs seem to be lost if they weren't recorded on Kinescope. But like a lot more of the radio stuff seems to have been recorded and saved. And uh, one that I brought up with Doug in the past is he wrote a score called Eyewitness about a prison uprising and there's an action cue in that that's 1956 the year before black patch so there i mean there are some examples but probably the black patch one is the that most sustained one to date you know he had little pieces but in, in radio it's not like radio you would move aside in a 23 minute radio program and have a two minute action cue he had right. much shorter uh sort of cues to work with right in those you, days well and the instrumental <laughs> forces you're talking about in black patch you know 60 piece orchestra mm -hmm. you know in radio you're talking about you know 12 musicians or nine sure. musicians mm -hmm. or something yeah so right. what you can get away with is considerably different when when he's now got a whole orchestra in front of him he can get away with a whole lot absolutely and the first oh, thing that jumped to my mind when jeff asked that was when we went through the CBS library music, which we can't really be sure when he wrote some of these cues, we found a cue called, of all things, Jailbreak, which was another amazing staccato action cue that- Yeah, with the sure crazy he, horns, kind of yeah. like Herman and everything. And we don't know where it came yeah, from, Jeff so it could have been a re-recorded radio or re-recorded television, but it probably predates 61 at least. Or just a wild library cue quite yeah, likely exactly he's got and that he's got a cue he calls breakout um mm -hmm. going all the way back to his radio days and then you'll mm -hmm. show it see it show up and have gun will travel you know not the same music but the the title itself mm -hmm. yeah. and i always thought it was really ironic that you get into 1975 or whatever it was and there he's scoring a movie called breakout yeah and then of course in capricorn one the highlight of capricorn one is Breakout. Breakout. So yeah. somehow you get the impression, Jerry, did you like the name Breakout? <laughs> well, I don't think he titled the film. That'd be funny if he did. But <laughs> well, I'll no, exactly. One. But it's just ironic. So if, if you're the producer on making Breakout, a movie, who would you hire to write music for mm -hmm. Breakout? Well, Jerry, mm -hmm. of course. That's that's why Danny Elfman needs to score a film called Final Confrontation, and and yes. you know then he'll have his breakout moment. Or what's the uh, on First Flight? How many times did Jerry do a cue called oh, First Flight? Quite a few. Bill, Bill, you were starting to say something a moment ago. Did you did you remember oh, what I forgot. it was? Sorry. I oh no worries, no worries. Just wanted to to check. Um, well, yeah. It, well, I guess go back to Bill. Bill, is that your French horn case in the corner? Yes, it is. My beautiful con 8D. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Uh -huh. But uh, but kind of going to, to Jeff's question, uh, I think it's striking just how fully formed Jerry Goldsmith's voice was in this very first feature film score he did. Like like Bill pointed out, there are echoes of you know his older contemporaries working at the time, like you know, Alfred Newman and Bernard Herman in the score for sure. But uh, at the same time. You know that you would not mistake this, I think, for anything other than a Jerry Goldsmith score. He's filtering it's, the influence into his own uh, unique voice. It's you the mixed meters. It. It's all yeah. those mixed meters right from the start. Well, yeah. You see, Jerry constantly just goes with mixed meters everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a even lot though, of even though Black Patch doesn't have a lot of the crazy mixed meters, but 
in a way he wrote it in a way that it feels like mixed meters because he would put accents on bars and um, he would write it with a slow tempo. So the orchestra's going, bada bum, bada bum, da da da, ba da da. It feels like, and accents on the different parts mm-hmm. of the beat. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling, like I said, he had this, his foot in the golden age and he's like looking at the future. And I have a feeling that was all playing into this. And it was he. He was developing this kind of sound that's going to come, you know. It's, um, and then it's got, he would end up doing all the multimeter stuff crazy on later on. But anyway, it's an interesting transition score because you definitely hear the golden age in it, especially in the romantic cues. But well, especially it, the the Bernard Herrmann stuff, sure. you know. It's Herman bum, and bum, bum. You know, you got those chords, that, and you could hear totally every Herman. once in a while Alfred Newman. Oh, oh, and it's over at the robe. Yeah. You'll hear, you know, every once in a while you hear the robe sneaks in. Kind of and the like, harmonies and, and that sort yep, of thing. Yep, yeah. Yeah. And and of course he he looked up to to Newman a lot and and Newman was so influential in that period. But yeah, I mean it, it's got it's got its foot in the silver age too, though. Like there are yes. kind of modern edgy elements in the score that don't sound like a typical score from the 1950s. Like there are there are more kind of gritty uh less melodic elements in this as well so i think the the, there's so much variety in this 34 minute score i think it's going to be surprising to a lot of listeners and i think it's going to you know kind of open up their ears kind of like it was for lee to jerry goldsmith's earliest output and and you know maybe allow them to enjoy it in a way that they didn't think they could like like how david was saying he always used to have trouble with the thriller stuff until the the tadlow albums and the the re-recordings kind of open that up you know in modern sound hearing the earliest goldsmith i think is going to be a revelation for a lot of people i hope so i'm only afraid that fans of goldsmith are going to be expecting to hear total recall right off the bat or anything like that and they're going to be disappointed if that's what happens but fans of goldsmith you know the face of a fugitive earlier this year i mean they fans what? of Goldsmith know that his 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 work spans the decades. Yeah, yeah we can we can solve that problem. I hope track, so. Track one of Black Patch will be those eight bars out of the fight that sound like Total Recall. That'll be the very <laughs> first go. thing we edit on the album, so people will go, <laughs> "Oh wow, this is going to be like Total Recall." <laughs> that was it. Wow, but that was still yeah. like Total Recall. But, but hey, Doug. <laughs> That love theme is almost worth the price of a mission, don't you think? Like, yeah, I was mentioning um, it, it. Anybody that's well, if they haven't seen the film, um, there's similarities to Lonely Are the Brave because you're talking about a, a triangle of characters, two yeah. men and a woman, yeah. but they're not enemies; they're friends. Yeah. And she chose one to marry because the other left. You know, had, yeah, had basically run away. And so when they kind of reunite, you're talking about it's a very painful reunion because they're friends. It's a triangle, but it's not a competitive triangle. And right. uh, Jerry got that emotion immediately exactly. by writing a, uh, it's a minor key, so it's sad, obviously, but it's also a very haunting theme as opposed to a love theme per se. It's very mm-hmm. haunting. It's a tune that says what could have been but just didn't happen. And uh, my it, whole point was that that theme alone is worth. It, the exactly. Price of the it, it's, it's so it's beautiful. Just, it's like, yeah. It's, yeah. it's I, like, I, I literally got a tear in my eye when we were conducting it, when, when I was yeah. conducting it. Honestly. How can you not? Like, it, I mean, even moving. in the movie, I get and, chills up my spine watching, the, you know, those sequences in the movie, just because he makes it so magical. I mean, the, when the harp, the delicate, you know, kind of harp, comes in during the yeah. the romantic yeah, that's stuff. This, that's the second half of that cue called Love Reunited. Yeah, it's just breathtaking. You that's know, right. you get you, your the the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And in the and context that's, that's, of the film, because he was such a dramatist, it makes they do a very sudden embrace that it doesn't seem like a, a 1940s 
we just met, now we're madly in love embrace, it's a worrisome embrace because you know that she's married his friend. and Exactly. And, it, and no. so it, he, he cues into what the movie's doing in such a way that, yeah, it's it's really it's well, it's a Jerry complex was on top emotion. Of the idea that um, we've already seen um, George Montgomery's character reuniting with mm-hmm. with Leo Gordon's character as they were friends, right? And then Leo Gordon says, "I've got another surprise for you." And then the surprise, of course, is you know that it's married, you know, married to George Montgomery's former girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. like I say, and Jerry realized, I think. But this is not a love triangle. We're not. It, it's not a competitive, you know, traditional. Mm-hmm. You know, they're enemies. You know, they're fighting for the same woman. It's three people in a very tragic situation, which is why I said it's interesting. It foreshadows exactly mm-hmm. what "Lonely Are the Brave," um, just a few years later, was where you have three characters, but they all love each other. They're they're, mm-hmm. they're characters who care about each other. It just unfortunately one's a love story that could have been but never was, you right? Know, kind of, right. So and I think he's capturing. I think he's capturing even more than just the just the relationship between those two people as well. I think he's capturing something of the main character's uh, pain and damage. I mean, you you the black patch on his face is kind of a a you know physical manifestation uh, manifestation of his. Um, kind of internal emotional injuries, I think, from not only whatever happened between them, but he he has this beautiful monologue in the film about how he's seen too much war and killing. And, you know, it's a powerful thing because it, it's not dwelled upon too long in the film, but he's a he's a Civil War veteran and he has this this injury where where he lost an eye. And I think there's something of that in the theme as well because it's really capturing his regrets and and about the past and his damage you know that that has happened to him as a person as well and you've already yeah, right that's never actually idea. explained either is it no it's well, not spelled it, it, out yeah there's no like this is what uh, happened to me i'm sorry Doug. At, well it's just if you think of you know someone like jerry scores looking at the beginning and the ending and he puts this all together um it's one of the reasons I always considered it underrated Western. It's not a great Western. You know, it's not the searchers, but when you get to the end, the climax, the gunfight, if you will, um, who's it with? It's with his partner, his, his dep- you know, not really a deputy, but the, it, but it protege the character or something calls almost. fly trap. Remember yeah. fly trap. The one that, that mm-hmm. I mean, a friend of his, and in the very end, instead of a gunfight, you have him disarming his friend, remember? And it, it's interesting because when you get through all of the drama and the story, the last dramatic confrontation ends up being kind of full circle. It's with a character in the beginning that they kind of push around a lot. They call him Flytrap. Uh, Carl, I guess, is his character's name. But you don't really have a gunfight at the end. There is no gun battle. And they could have because they show the two of them you know, kind of joining and walking off together, presumably to confront the actual, you know, mustache twirling villain of the piece, the Frenchie character, right? But that they don't, tra- they don't depict. I think the it's kind Sebastian of a brave, Cabot? but, but no, yeah, they, it's they Sebastian Cabot. Really, but they don't go that far because the ending of the picture, that emotional peak of that picture is clearly a resolution to the mm-hmm. three way love. And the fact that the dramatic gunfight conflict at the end of the film, like I say, is his friend. Mm-hmm. So they don't actually have a showdown per se. So yeah. in the architecture of a traditional Western, this movie is definitely not your traditional Western, even though it it's breaks a small the rules. little picture. Oh, definitely. Yeah, because if, if, the, if the picture didn't end with one of them tragically killing the other, you know, you would expect it would end with going and confronting the baddies, right? Yeah. Who are still, they're not dealt with but at the don't. end of the film. Yeah. But that's kind of tying in with, you know, Jerry's final cue being so abrupt. The film just kind of ends there. And I and I think it was right. intentional. I don't think it was, they were lazy. They didn't feel like filming a final gun, ba- no, gun right, battle with the right. bad guys. It was, you know, this, we've, we've reached the emotional conclusion of the film. We don't need to just have a gratuitous, 
shootout with with the bad guys because that's not necessarily what the film is about it's not about okay. overcoming those bad guys it's about overcoming other things so jerry i think was really you know intelligent in his emotional approach but also the filmmakers made an interesting choice in ending the film there you know which again might come off to us as viewers as being abrupt and why don't we get that final battle with with the comeuppance of uh yep. the villain frenchie but you don't need it you know it's uh it's kind of a powerful and unique ending in its own way and even more bold because one of the best westerns ever made to that point was red river which ends in a very similar manner john wayne and montgomery clift facing off and ultimately not shooting each other but even the biggest fans of Hawks and Red River will say that's the the part of the movie that doesn't work. And there are two cuts that's of it true. that have that's different, so true. different versions of that ending. And neither one of them quite pulls it off emotionally, but in Black Patch. I re I recorded that whole score, Red River. Mm -hmm. you, so you did I Red know. River? I did. Oh boy. The whole score. For Noxos, yeah. So I know the whole what you're talking about. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's Sorry to interrupt, but, but yeah. yeah, so here's a here's a movie attempting to end in that same way. Your bar is right to say that it's bold. And I think, you know, again, you put the wrong music behind that ending, and maybe it comes off as as sort of Trite perfunctory or... as Red River's ending did, but it doesn't really. I mean, the only reason we expect there to be a gunfight is because Westerns end with gunfights, but this story doesn't have to be leading in that direction. That was actually a great parallel you just brought up. Yeah, that exactly. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, shall we all, shall we sign off? Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for spending so long here. I really enjoyed I the conversation. Yeah. Uh, glad you came back a few times, Bill. It was it was yeah, nice no to kidding. see you return. Yeah, I just had uh, to take a shower, but we're going out to dinner now. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, have a good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure Thanks. to see everybody. Lee, take thank care. you so much for everything, man. We we need to talk more often, okay? Yes, of course. All right. Yes, and, and we, we need to talk more often. Four hour and Doug, you and I, we need to talk. More yes. Often. Doug, yeah. yeah Doug. We got to line up our next project. Yes. Doug, we haven't even gotten this album out yet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we could talk to all of you while the memories were still fresh in your minds from just a few weeks ago. So I, right. I appreciate you taking the time now. Well, thanks you for it. your support. Thanks, y'all. appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Always, guys. All Bye, right. Doug. Good night. Alrighty. Thanks, Have a everybody. good day, folks. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye everybody. Bye, -bye. Nice you all. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Lee. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, Bill. My pleasure.